everyone. It's good to see you all. And Josh, we've got the recording and transcription started. So yes, for those of you who may be a little bit new, um, we always record committee meetings. So um, to let you know you are being recorded. Um, Josh does a little bit of magic with the help of HMIS. And um, they also get posted on the website, on the Hanford.gov website. That's just part of the gig. Stan, would you like to kick us off? Absolutely. Can you hear me? <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So good morning and welcome to the December 2021 Hanford Advisory Board Public Involvement and Communications Committee meeting. My name is Stan Branch. I am the Deputy Designated Federal Officer for the Hanford site. As a reminder, this meeting will be conducted in accordance with the requirements of the Federal Advisory Committee Act. Advisory committees have played an important role in shaping programs and policies of the federal government. The Hanford Advisory Board's role provides policy level advice and recommendations concerning the following EM specific site specific issues such as cleanup activities and environmental restoration, waste and nuclear fuels, waste and nuclear materials management and disposition, excess facilities, future land use and long-term stewardship, risk management and communications. I appreciate your attendance today and look forward to the Hanford Advisory Board's Public Involvement and Communications Committee development and submission of constructive, actionable policy level advice on the Hanford cleanup. Uh, again, welcome and thank you for your presence today and look forward to a constructive meeting. Back to you, Ruth. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'm going to put the agenda up and send it to Jeff. Great. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeff Burr. I, I work with the Oregon Department of Energy. Uh, I'm a HAB member and the chair of the, the PIC committee, as we call it, for new members. First off, I just want to thank you all for being here, for giving a large part of your day on a very busy HAB week. Uh, I know it's a lot to ask you to all come and, and be involved. Um, the, the point of today is to talk about public involvement uh, as we do regularly. Uh, so I hope to see good participation today so that we can all make this uh, a good use of all of our time. Um, Today, I'm going to start with an overview of what the PIC is, what we traditionally do, uh, what our goals are uh, to help new members who are here this morning uh, to, I don't know, get, get your feet wet a little bit, know what we're all about. Uh, and then we will, I guess, let's just review the agenda since we're here looking at it now. Uh, we'll flip flop those a little bit. Uh, we'll look at our minutes from past meetings and see if there are any comments before we finalize those and put them in the record. If there are any agency announcements, we will invite those. And then we're going to have this morning a round robin question. This is something that we like to do every pick meeting. Uh, usually we'll pick, you know, some sort of open ended question and gather people's perspectives and feedback. It's a chance for us to all get to know each other and how each other think as well as sometimes to actually give some good advice to the agencies. And this round robin question, I believe, was requested by DOE. Uh, and I think it's a great one to ask. And it's fairly simple. What is the number one idea that you have that could increase participation in public involvement meetings right now? So as I'm giving the overview of what the pick is, have that question rolling around in your brain. And, and if you have any thoughts, uh, please do chime in. Uh, if we can scroll down, please. Thanks. The next is a standing item that we do every meeting. We are going to go over the tri-party agency public involvement calendar, which you can find on the website for the Hanford site. Um, but we're going to get a guided tour of what's coming up in the next three to six months. And you can have your questions answered about what those meetings are, what they pertain to, uh, to help you do your own planning for how you want to be involved. After that, we'll talk about uh, any recent meetings that you've been a part of, as well as some discussion of upcoming meetings. This is a chance for us to reflect on what's been working and what hasn't been working in meetings, 
and things that we hope to see going forward, especially as now we're kind of on the cusp of maybe reopening the world and what that might look like going forward. And so we'll have a little bit of time to talk about that. Uh, we'll have lunch and then in the afternoon, somewhat of an extension of that looking forward topic is a an opportunity for us to talk about a, a couple of things that all relate together. One of them is the response that we got from the agencies to the most recent advice that the PIC put forward um, that we were the leads on. And that relates to public involvement in some kind of foundational fundamental decision support documents for the site uh, and what our expectations and, and hopes are for public involvement versus what we've seen. Taking that idea and the agency response, we get to process that response together and whether it, it satisfies, uh, but also then using that feedback to think about, all right, what if we do reopen in the spring? What if we have this welcome back to Hanford in person? Let's think about all the big decisions that are out there and what our expectations for public involvement are for those and how we might be able to blend that all together. My grand idea is, can we have a spring welcome back meeting where we talk about some of these big decisions that are out there and, and what the public involvement process is going to be for those. After that, we have our open forum uh, that's open to all any ideas as they relate to uh, public involvement. Uh, but specifically, we're also very interested in what would make it easier for um, new and returning HAB members to be engaged in Hanford. Are there things that we need to change about how we're doing business? Um, optimal meeting design post COVID, and then just whatever's on your mind. After that, we do HAB member self assessments, which is our opportunity to talk to each other about how we are spreading the word, how we are talking about Hanford in our own communities with our own constituencies, um, as well as the things we're hearing. And then we'll talk about committee business, uh, the, the next topics uh, for future meetings. So that's our day. Uh, are, was there anything that I missed in discussing what what's up ahead? I guess I'd look to Gary or Ruth. Thank you. Good. Covered it. Are there questions from folks who are with us about the agenda and what we're planning on doing? Okay, not hearing anything. I uh, will jump right into the committee overview. I've got a couple of slides to show here. Do you wanna, can you just take it? There you go. Uh, they've got the ball. Okay, Public Involvement and Communications Committee is a mouthful. Um, we call it the PIC. Um, PIC committee is also okay. It's not like saying ATM machine because there, there are two C's in there. Uh, let's see, get to the next slide. My computer is very slow, pardon me. There we go. Okay, so public involvement is one of the foundational, oh, people aren't seeing the slides? Yeah, oh. let me make sure okay. that I- Let me try again here. I should be out of. Thank you for letting me know. There you go. Everyone seeing? OK. Great. So back oh, 10 years ago now, the Hanford Advisory Board developed a series of values um, that were common to all of the members. They ran the gamut of cleanup related topics, uh, but there is this one here that is specifically aimed at public involvement. Uh, and it says that the Hanford cleanup decisions can have impacts on people in the environment for hundreds of years to come, and that the public should have meaningful opportunities to influence cleanup decisions through open and transparent processes. And I see the purpose of the pick to ensure that this value is upheld um, and to provide input to the agencies as they plan and engage the public to make sure that this have value is upheld. 
Uh, if you're a new member, I highly encourage you to look at the link down at the bottom corner where you can see all of the HAB values that we developed a decade ago, uh, both to see where this board has been, but also to then measure your own values against what the board values have historically been, uh, because all things change with time. So the purpose of the pick on a on a more granular level, the types of activities that we get involved in, we advise the tri-party agencies on public involvement efforts, which can be anything from what is the point of the meeting that you plan to have to how are you reaching communities to get them to to come and participate in these meetings? How are you making that involvement meaningful? Uh, are there other public engagement opportunities that are beyond just meetings in rooms, ways that we can inform people about Hanford as well as solicit their feedback? Um, a topic that we've recently reinvigorated is this idea of environmental justice as well as diversity, equity, and inclusion and how these concepts and values are being brought into the Hanford cleanup. And I know that EPA has been doing a lot of work on a national level and DOE as well at the headquarters level has new directives related to this. However, environmental justice has been woven into the fundamental cleanup laws of Hanford for decades. And so it's something that we do want to make sure that we are engaged in as well. Um, and then any revisions, the, the tri-party agreement, which is the the architectural document that describes how the agencies work together has a public involvement plan as a part of it. And so if there were ever any changes to that public involvement plan at the highest level, the PIC would be involved there. Uh, just kind of as a boots on the ground level, we really enjoy, I, I really enjoy the opportunity to take a look at fact sheets, uh, draft presentations, any kind of surveys that the agencies are putting together as well as the public involvement calendar because we're kind of the test audience and we can provide that service to the agencies to help them see when things maybe could be communicated more clearly um, when it's not clear how input from the public is going to be meaningful and that kind of feedback that we can give um, the big picture point of the pick though i think is to make public involvement more effective whether that's through formal advice, recommendations, or simply just the discussions that we have here in the meeting that are then documented and provide food for thought for the public involvement officers of the agencies who are here today and listening and participating. Uh, as Liz and I, Liz was the former PIC chair, and she said, sometimes we say the same thing over and over and we sound like a broken record, but that's okay because the core ideas of transparency, accessibility, and meaningful involvement stay the same. And so we are here to uphold a standard and, and sometimes that does mean we repeat ourselves, uh, but the, the overall goal is to have a meaningfully engaged public, uh, to, to tease that out and try to keep it fresh and adapting to changing times and technology and new ways of communicating, all those things. Uh, what else do we do? I, I came up with this kind of clunky metaphor last year, thinking about, I used to live in Walla Walla and they had this great gazebo at the park right in the middle of town. And you would see all manner of public gathering happen there, um, whether it be debates or musical shows or, or festivals or dances or what have you, that there's a, a a physical place where things can happen together. And the idea was that not only could the pick be that as kind of the, the gathering place where we can talk about Hanford, but that we are here to try to help the agencies create those spaces as they do their public involvement efforts to make the Hanford public involvement feel like a space for gathering and for talking about the cleanup. Um, we, as we'll do to later today, reflect on the public meetings that we attend as a continual improvement kind of effort. 
Uh, we talk about the interactions we've had with the public and with our communities because it is our responsibility as members of the Hanford Advisory Board to not become insular, to step outside of just the the 60 some people that come to these meetings and to make sure that we are reaching back to the communities that we represent um, and make sure that what we're saying in these meetings is reflective of the things that we are hearing from the people that we interact with. Uh, and, you know, our goal is to seek shared values. Uh, and sometimes we even will have reading lists. So we used to do this a lot more of book clubs and recommendations of things that you've read that are interesting related to Hanford history or cleanup in general, or some of the big questions that we grapple with here at Hanford. Uh, for new members, uh, you can find the HAB advice on the Hanford Advisory Board website. And I just wanted to highlight here some of the pieces of advice that either were that either began with the PIC or that the PIC played a, a large part in helping get through the process. Uh, we've got a couple that we'll be discussing this week uh, with the the board of boards across all of the sites. Uh, they had some public involvement specific requests of all of the boards and we we answered that call. Uh, we also recently talked about effective virtual public meetings, which I'm, I'm happy to see that some of those recommendations have been brought forward over time and, and implemented, and that's good to see. Uh, public involvement in budget development is something that we did with the Budget and Contracts Committee. And the, the bottom two there relate to what used to be called State of the Site Meetings, but now are called Hanford Regional Dialogues. We have helped design new types of public interactions uh, that I hope to see return in the coming year. That's all I had for you. Uh, I'd like to open it up if there's anybody else who is either a returning member of the PIC who wants to add to what I've said here, or if you're a new member and you have any questions or thoughts about what the PIC is and what we're here to do, um, please. Now, the floor is open for a couple of minutes. If anyone wants to. Hey, Jeff, this is Steve. I don't know if you want to just jump in here. I probably should have waved my hand or something. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, I guess just to reiterate, I thought one of the most important elements in terms of um, what we're trying to do is, is really educate so that people um, can learn, which is, uh, you know, why is this so important for public involvement? And then, uh, you know, we need to really help ensure that it is important. So hold accountability is to, you know, making sure we get responses from from participants. And uh, when we do make submissions on um, kind of what we should be doing and why we think it's important. So those those things for getting additional public involvement to me is just uh, the education process we need to emphasize and I know everybody kind of sees that but I just wanted to chime that in as well re-emphasize thanks thank you Steve anybody else want to talk about what you see as primary goals of the pick or or ways that we do business. Jeff, this is Shelley. I'm thinking maybe you might describe the process really quickly for the committee developing issue manager teams. And uh, I don't know where, maybe this is the wrong place for that, but it might be a good idea to talk about how issue manager teams get developed and how advice gets developed and then moved forward uh, to the full board meetings. Okay. I can give the, the elevator version. I would expect, and Ruth, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that the new member orientation happening this afternoon is probably going to give an overview of that process. And there's a, a fancy figure that shows how you flow through. But 
The, the short version is this. Uh, during board discussions uh, in our committees, whether that be in the PIC or one of the technical committees or however, if an idea gets raised that has some juice, that people are interested in, that rises to the level where there seems to be some group consensus that, hey, this might be some good advice for the agencies or, or there's something here that's worth exploring a little bit. The chair of the committee with the consent of the group uh, can start up what's known as an issue management team. And that is an offshoot of the committee whose job it is to go work together and write up a draft. Um, and it can be, you know, a little bit messy. It can have its advice points, just kind of the kernel of the idea. Um, there's an overview of why we think this advice is important. That issue management team uh, then brings that product back to the committee. Or sometimes if they don't have a product yet, they just have, hey, we've all been talking, we've been following this issue, here are some things we think are important. Whatever they bring back to the committee, the committee can then work on together. And if it if it's in the shape of advice, the committee can then pass that through consensus to exit the committee and go to the full board for consideration. At that point, the full board can uh, discuss the merits of the advice, kind of a, a thumbs up, thumbs down, whether they think that the advice as a concept is worth moving forward. And then if there are additional edits to the advice that need to happen to make it something that the whole board can consent to, that tends to happen during our full board meetings. So there's there are several gates that an idea passes through from the initial kernel of an idea that pops up during a meeting, just during our discussions, or as a result of a specific requested topic, to then an issue management team starts working on it. They bring that product to the committee. The committee works on it until the committee is happy with it. Committee passes it forward to the full board, and then the full board works on it until the full board decides either to pass it or not. Uh, we're going to see an example of that tomorrow with a piece of advice that worked through the Tank Waste Committee. Uh, if anyone else has things to add to that. I got it. All right. Uh, so, and I'm sure there will be a, a more in-depth discussion of how that works uh, this afternoon. And Liz, you are in queue. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I, I was just going to um, add one other thing that I think the pit can do. Um, and, you know, it's always different. The in-person version of what the hab is is very different than the online virtual world. Um, but I do think we have a role in like re-energizing um, re ourselves, each other, the agencies in um, coming up with fresh ideas that get people excited to try new things and get people engaged. Um, there can be kind of like a, like everyone's energy kind of slumps together as we get tired and, and <clears throat> the virtual world of working together is just not the best place for feeling connected, although it's better than nothing. And in the past, um, I feel like it's just helpful to remember that there's the way we do things and sometimes we, or there's some new thing we start doing and then that's the way we do things, but there's always room for change and um, new ideas. And that's one thing, like, especially if you're new to the board, there's space for your ideas and thoughts because it is hard to get people engaged and aware of Hanford. Um, it can feel like a slog. It can feel kind of exhausting to be saying the same thing over and over again. Um, and there are a lot of barriers for the agencies to implement some of the ideas that we generate here. Um, but in the very beginning, when I first got into a leadership role in PIC, I remember meeting with our facilitator at the time and I was just frustrated I was like why do we have to have all our topics be the specific way I'm so it's just like stifles open conversation and she was like what do you want to do we don't have to do it that way and I was like wait what we can we could do something different 
And so we started um, playing around. I was like, I want people out of their chairs and, and walking around the room. I want us to talk together and not just be doing, you know, these kind of like bend conversations. And it did generate some new ideas and got people thinking and involved and sharing in a way that um, helped us know each other, which, you know, and, and take examples from other um, parts of our lives, other experiences, previous, you know, pre Hanford or outside of Hanford work, what works in other spaces to get people to show up. Um, and I really remember those conversations. Um, lots like people with flip chart markers walking around the room, putting notes on the walls. Um, so hopefully there is a time where we return to that in person environment that's a little bit more dynamic. Um, I really hope that for, for the have in the committee work. Um, but just wanted to share that um, sometimes it can feel like we're stuck and maybe that's something we should be listening to to say, okay, how do we want to shake this up, try something new, um, just to get new ideas on the table and uh, re-energize for everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Liz. I reminded you and I were talking on the phone a few weeks ago and you were talking about, we used to have so much fun as the board. <laughs> and, you would tell these stories about costume parties and like a prom. And I know Tom in my office really wants to bring back karaoke uh, that, and there's this open question of how important is having fun together to making an effective cleanup? You know, will the people a hundred years from now benefit more if we had a good time together talking about Hanford cleanup and finding ways to to share common ground and maybe maybe fun has a part in all of this and having these relationships together, maybe it's more important than we all think. Um, and just, it, it got me thinking and I hope it gets some of you all thinking as well about, especially when we all get to see each other again. Um, I look forward to actually spending some time in the off hours together. Uh, if there are any other thoughts, uh, please feel free to jump in the queue, anybody at any time. Uh, but not seeing anything else right now, let's move on to announcements and see if the agencies have anything that they'd like to bring up to us uh, before we dive into the rest of our, our day. Yeah. We all yeah. jump at once. Sorry about that. <laughs> this is David Bowen over at Ecology. I don't really have any announcements other than just saying thank you for everybody who takes their time uh, to participate in these committee meetings and on the HAB. It's a really important role uh, for the process and for ecology and for cleanup on site. So that's really my message for this morning. And then Ryan looks like he has his hand up. Go ahead, Ryan. Thanks, David. I was just going to add on to that. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I was um, I recently started as the communications manager for ecology on uh, December 1st, so I replaced Randy's position. So if, if any of you have any kind of communications related questions or inquiries, you can feel free to reach out to me. Um, so that position has been uh, filled now. Hi, everyone. Uh, oh, yeah. Also, congratulations, uh, Ryan. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, just wanted to quickly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Robert Armijo. I'm one of the uh, seven remedial project managers for EPA and uh, also the de facto uh, public involvement uh, representative for EPA. And uh, I'd like to reiterate uh, what David said. Uh, thanks everyone for their time and commitment uh, to the board. Uh, regarding agency updates, uh, there's not a whole lot to report on, uh, up, to give updates on. Um, so I'll leave it off with that. Knock out a couple of this is, oh, sorry. So this is Stan Branch and the Deputy Designated Federal Office for the, for the Hanford site, and also um, uh, Gary Younger, who uh, carries the heavy weight in getting all of this uh, preparation stuff done for the board. So uh, appreciate everyone's presence today, and uh, I'll turn it over to Gary so if he has any other words you'd like to say. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, nothing to announce today. We're just glad that everyone is here. And uh, uh, 
ready to help us solve some of the toughest challenges in the world here at Hanford. Thank you, Tom. I'm going to do a couple of meeting minutes before we jump into the round robin. Well, let's do. Right. Let's see, so starting with May, um, normally we don't get quite this far behind, but we managed to do that courtesy of some packet challenges. So. Um, the May summary, we did not receive any comments, corrections, confusions. Um, are there anybody who has something they'd like fixed? Um, oh, we should probably smell, spell committee business correctly. Any other corrections? Jeff, my suggestion is that the committee adopt this one um, subject to spell check. All right, <clears throat> move to adopt. Uh, if there are any who oppose, please speak up. You can see I'm not very good at this whole formal process stuff. Yeah. So what we do is we finalize minutes and we post them on Hanford.gov so people can go back and find them and figure out what you talked about and when you talked about it. Which is useful. Or it even helps you these days just go back and find the spot in the video so you can watch it yourself. You can do it. You can read it and you can hear it both. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, the, other, the other one was for the September meeting. Um, a little, a little more current. Um, we did have one suggestion. Josh, do you want to, do you want to review that one real quick? I didn't warn you I was going to put you on the spot, did I? Uh, no, you did not. So, way down on page nine, there was a misspelling of communication. Uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six paragraphs in third line. Right. It, there it is. Yeah. We'll, we'll see. Are there other suggestions, things you caught that need to be fixed? No, I I like the narrative of the round robin. So just kudos. Yeah, Josh. yeah so the for anyone new, the way this works, um, we record the meetings. Josh also takes notes. Olivia um, helps. Um, Josh and Olivia are part of the facilitation team. And in roughly about two weeks after a meeting, um, both the draft minutes are available as well as the recording. So it's it's about a two week turnaround. Um, and that's partly a function of the fact that we have committee weeks. So we, we tend to do them in, in chunks and it takes a little while to process all that. With your permission, we will clean these up and get them posted on the website. Yes, thank you. I'm going to go back to agenda so you can see the questions. How many buttons does it take to do this? As I'm looking at these notes again, I'm saying, oh, 
right, there was something I was supposed to do there. Okay. <laughs> so it's helpful for me. Thank you. Oh, I wouldn't have any sanity if it weren't for John. So if we move on. Yeah, Steve, no comment means the vote passes, right? Yeah, it's it's a relatively loose process. So shall we move on to the round robin? Yes, <clears throat> thank you. Let's do. My suggestion is we just go down the participant list. Um, or do you want to just do it popcorn style and have folks jump in? If you have the list handy, uh, I think that would be nice just so we make sure we don't miss anybody. The way we do the round robins, uh, we begin with people who are formally members of the pick. Uh, and just as a note to new members, the pick is your freebie committee. You're allowed to join two of the other committees, but anyone can join the pick. And all you have to do is send an email to Ruth or or have at slind.com and say, hey, I'd like to be a, a formal member of the pick. And then you're on. Um, so we start with pick members. We then expand it to anybody who's on the HAB who is here participating today. And then we expand it to anybody who's on the call who has a thought. Um, we, we do like to open that up um, if, if people want to participate. However, no one is required to participate. Um, if you prefer to pass, please just say I pass and, and that's a-okay. And I see that Shelly has her hand raised before we get going here. Oh, I'm in the get go. <laughs> oh, you want to you want to yeah. start? OK, I don't care if I start, but I have something to say. All right. Sure. Let me double check. We've got two people on the phone and I one of them is Stan Branch. I'm not sure who the other is. Um, Emmett, is that you the other one? I just want I don't want to leave people off who are on the phone simply because I don't recognize the phone number. Well, Shelly, why don't you kick us off and then we'll, yeah. we'll go down the list. Okay, thanks. I, I'm really, uh, the most important thing is getting direct feed low activity waste going and uh, getting it operating. And I think we need another, I think we need to think about uh, designing another public involvement event uh, uh, to talk about it. And so my thought was that we could, we could have, and this would be for next year, so 2022, and uh, you know something on the lines of direct feed, low activity waste from startup to operations, the building and commissioning of a one of a kind facility, and uh, and then talk yeah. about, uh, you know, DOE come in and talk about the team again and uh, the integration effort that it's taken to, and the goals and the timelines for for getting uh, direct feed up and running, um, talk about the challenges and the accomplishments and solutions uh, and design challenges, so, you know, design challenges over this time. And, uh, and then the realities of building a one of a kind facility in COVID times and when we've got uh, a pretty serious um, supply chain challenges at time and, uh, and make this real and, um, and so these are just some formative thoughts on that. But I think it would be wise to possibly do that in the spring and set, set the public up, start them thinking about, hopefully, uh, uh, the startup. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you. And Solitz, would you like to jump in? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, this is something I've been harping on, I guess, for a while. It doesn't seem to be getting much traction, but I'll give it another shot. We've, uh, in a different way, we've finished the petroleum finishing plant. That's, I think that's slab on grade now, if I'm not mistaken. And I think this would be a good opportunity 
to ask the public how they would like to have this this site remembered as kind of a prototype for, rem for, for remembering these other sites and uh, reminding folks of what was there and where it went and how long we're going to have to pay attention to it. And it might be useful to apply for some technical funds to put out a request for uh, uh, some kind of projects, whether they be art or uh, landscape art or uh, whatever, uh, you know, and maybe even a contest is that in, in the public schools as to how, how to remember this site. So anyway, that's, that's my thoughts on that. Thank you, Dan. Dan Strom, would you like to, would you like to participate? Yeah, uh, good, good morning. Uh, I, I'm Dan Strom, I've been on, oh dear. Sorry. I've been on the Hanford Advisory Board for uh, uh, just a year, and uh, my background's in radiation protection. And I, I guess my only comment is that, um, you know, we've had 184 COVID deaths in Franklin County and almost 400 in Benton County. How many of those people who died? caught COVID while they were working at Hanford. And, you know, that's the elephant in the room. We're talking about theoretical deaths from groundwater 10,000 years from now, assuming no medical progress in treating radiation caused health effects. Um, and the, it, anyway, I, <laughs> I'm just having trouble taking this, uh, this seriously when we should be doing everything we can to get every worker at Hanford vaccinated and boosted and get rid of people at Hanford who won't won't take care of others. So that's my public health uh, radiation protection perspective. <laughs> you know, yes, Hanford cleanup is important, but man, our current focus is just to me, it's just perverted. So thanks. All right. Dana Miller, welcome. Would you like to share your thoughts? Uh, good morning. Oops, camera. Good morning. I'm Dana Miller from uh, Yakima Nation Tribal Council. Uh, I haven't participated for a while, so I'm trying to catch up. And at this time, I'm going to uh, have to pass. We are glad you are with us today. Okay, thank you. I haven't seen you guys for a long time. Thanks. Right. Um, I'm going to buck the chair just a little bit because we have a number of new people and um, it's going to be easier for me to just invite HAB members to join in instead of segment pick members from those who haven't decided if they want to join the pick again. So I will ask for your forgiveness, Jeff. Um, Aaron, um, you're new with us, and I would love to know how to pronounce your last name properly. Would you like to share your thoughts? Good morning, everybody. Hi, my name is Aaron Breitsch. I'm the Transportation Planning Manager with the Benton Franklin Council of Governments. So if, uh, if you get anywhere close to Breitsch, I'm conditioned to listen to it, so that's completely okay. <laughs> right. Thank you. <laughs> We're glad you're here. Glad to be here and thank you for having me. Esteban. Esteban Ortiz. What's on your mind? Well, I'm glad. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm greeting everybody from South Texas. I'm glad, um, you know, new member, I guess a new member. <laughs> of the Hanford Advisory Board, live in Richland, Washington, but saying hi everybody from South Texas and glad to see people from the Yakima Nation here because I think um, they've been here contributing. I think that's what it's rich of uh, Washington State, right, of our native communities. And as a person who works with an environmental organization, nonprofit, I think to me that's the big thing that, you know, there's history and there's knowledge that 
we all should abide by it. And we're at, at a critical time. And, um, you know, I'm in South Texas right now where it's been in the 90s and above 20 degrees. And me hearing what's happening with with at Hanford, you know, I think hopefully we can get something done because, you know, like I've heard, I think in some of these meetings that a lot of the new generations are kind of concerned for our climate and our land and what's happening. Thank you and good morning, everybody. Thank you. Jerry, Jerry Paulette. There we go. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, a number of things that I'd like to share from Heart of America Northwest. Um, I would start with, and I waited in and weigh in on the first discussion because um, I was going to be starting on this point, and I know that we'll be discussing it. But Heart of America Northwest, as I'm beginning to sound like a broken record about, strongly believes that the TPA agencies and the Hanford Advisory Board need to design a ongoing and meaningful dialogue with the public that truly reshapes and influences the strategic plans for Hanford cleanup. Nothing is more fundamental in the realm of public involvement than the strategic plan for cleanup and the subsequent flowing out of that five-year plans for cleanup. These are the guiding documents. They're also the documents that are those that are closest to the public for involvement and the easiest to understand and to weigh in on. And without public support and understanding and a feeling of efficacy that the public, when they weigh in, ha can influence the strategic plans for Hanford. What are the top priorities? When will they be addressed? What are the priorities for budget? Where the real decisions end up getting made. Without feel a feeling of efficacy and that they are being listened to, the public will continue to turn its back on Hanford cleanup and the funding for Hanford cleanup will dry up like a raisin. None of us want that, but that is the reality. And at this point in time, we've seen all input for strategic planning be classifiable as a joke. The, there were eight days given for some members of the Hanford Advisory Board to comment on the USDOE Hanford Cleanup Strategic Plan. The five-year plan wasn't a plan, it was a placemat, and I couldn't make that up better myself. That's what it was. It wasn't a plan. It was a nice graphic described as a placemat. As an experiment to see how the public could be involved in and their interest in strategic planning, we invested in a pretty extensive outreach effort to generate comments on the five-year plan and see what would happen if we uh, engaged in public outreach. I want to remind people that the entire Hanford TPA mailing list is down to, according to the comments on the Central Waste Complex uh, response to comments, 1,125 people. I would guesstimate that half of those people are contractors and agency people based on our prior review of that list. So at best, 1,000 people are on the mailing list for notice now, which is horribly sad. We have greater public involvement, uh, interest in minor cleanup projects, much in the state of Washington. And here we have the greatest, most contaminated site in the Western Hemisphere, $2 billion a year. Great resources from federal, 
and state agencies and a outreach effort that is shriveling on the vine like that reason. So we decided we'd see what would happen if we made a little investment in generating comments. We created a citizen's guide that Ecology reviewed, which we really appreciate. And we got it out with just about a week left in the comment period to people and asked people to comment. And in the space of about one week, over 386 people that we know of submitted comments on the five year plan. 386 in a week. And that's only the ones who we were notified from our efforts sent in comments. It shows <laughs> that there is incredible interest and ability for the public to participate, and we need to develop a strong regional plan for public involvement on strategic planning on the site. And the next step is to see what is going to happen with those comments? One of the questions I have today is, has Ecology received those comments? Has EPA? I'd like to know if EPA and Ecology have received the comments submitted on the five-year plan, and what are you doing with those comments separately from USDOE? And I think that it really demonstrates that we need to be able to work, and it's up to the HAB and the Public Involvement Committee to take the lead in developing that strategic planning regional input program. It's up to us to take the lead on doing it. We've talked about it. It's time for us to do it. So um, I'd like, I do want to answer, see if ecology and EPA have received and are going to do something with the 386, 400 comments on the five-year plan, or did they just go to USDOE where I'm afraid they will go into a round file? Hey, Jerry, uh, we have not gotten comments back on that. Uh, that was DOE's comment period. That wasn't our comment period, but I will be asking DOE if I can get a copy of those comments. Um, also a note, uh, between our combined uh, physical mailing list or email mailing list, that number is uh, is actually about 2,400 people. Um, I would ask then why um, when I, you know, I just looked again this morning to glance at it. I opened it up just minutes ago to make sure I had the number right and the CWC response to comment document says we've sent out notice on uh, the CWC and T plan uh, activities, uh, permits, and milestone changes to 1,124. Um, so, so yeah. um, guys, could we okay. table this for when we go down to reflections on recent and upcoming meetings? I, I don't want to lose the conversation, but I do want to make sure that we include as many people as possible in the round robin. Is that okay with you? So let me just conclude then. Uh, yes, obviously. I mean, I wasn't sure. Well, I know we're going to be talking about strategic planning, et cetera, but I, I didn't want to raise it in the first section. So I want to raise it here. And then um, there are a couple of other things that I think are of great importance. Um, the General Accounting Office issued a very important report on supplemental tank waste treatment this past week and noted that it could, with offsite disposal of waste, we could save billions of dollars and speed up actions by decades. And I think it's important for us to be looking at this and from public involvement viewpoint, um, and especially, and I'm mystified by ecology's statements because in ties to the fundamental lack of action on B109 with a leaking tank and the huge public concern we have, and there hasn't been a single public involvement 
or educational effort about B109's leak from the agencies, of course. And ecology is special responsibility, as does EPA here, on a leak from a circular unit, lack of response action, and Heart of America has no intention of letting the one year anniversary go come up on us without legal action occurring. Um, but in looking at that GAO report, I think I understand where ecology is coming from because ecology said we don't need to do anything on supplemental treatment, not even a decision until, and I quote from between the year 2040, quote, quote, 2040 to 2050. Well, we all know that single shell tanks are just going to keep leaking, popping the corks off and leaking into the ground. And if ecology's view is we don't have to do anything about supplemental treatment when it could literally get waste out of tanks decades faster, um, I think that's a fundamental issue that we need to discuss about the philosophy of the regulatory agency. So I will stop there and say that um, look for a major public involvement effort on B109 and legal action if the agencies are not responsive. Thank you. Um, Jacob, do you want to weigh in on the round robin before you run off to your other meeting? I have lost Jacob. I didn't realize he was double booked. So my apologies. I didn't I didn't want to leave him out. Um Emmett, Emmett Jackson. What's your number one idea that could increase participation in public meetings right now? Good morning. Hello, thank you. Uh my I think we need to if we want to inc be inclusive, we need to go to where those people are. And in other words, say, for example, if you want to capture some uh, ethnic groups, you have to go where the ethnic groups are. Uh, Afro-Americans, for example, uh, have a town hall, uh, hall meeting at, at one of the churches that gets participation. So that's just an example. Thank you. Thank you, Emmett. Liz Matson. Good morning. Um, my idea for um, increasing public participation right now in this virtual world um, might seem a little I don't know. It's I was it, it was an unexpected idea shared with me when I was talking with uh, Shannon Cram about having meetings recorded. And it might I'm not sure how true it is, but it seems like having meetings recorded is hampering free like open conversation. And I don't know if that's just on the agency side, but um, it just seems like there's a lot of fear for, of saying the wrong thing or getting in trouble or having to stick to a script because it is recorded. Um, that just makes open information sharing really um, just it's not happening in a way that I don't know if that's the cause or not, but I'd be curious to see uh, an experiment to see if there's a meeting that's not recorded, if it's a, a better flow of information and dialogue than what we've been seeing right now. Um, and um, so I'd like to try having an, a meeting that's not recorded. I, I like having a record, recorded meeting so I can go back and learn something. Um, and I guess I'll differentiate between the kinds of meetings. I think if it's an educational meeting, if it's like a one-sided, more one-sided, like we're going to give a presentation and share information with you, I think that could be fine to be recorded. When there's information sharing and a back and forth, um, that open flow just does not seem to be there with uh, in recorded sessions. And I'm curious to see if that would change uh, without it being recorded. Um, I also agree that there should be some kind of 
general topic for public participation um, that's not just a specific permit modification. Um, that's dialogue about um, the future of cleanup or end state, something that's accessible to people. Um, and that's, and I'll save other thoughts for later. Thanks so much. Thank you. Maya Burke, you're new with our group. Would you like to jump in on this question? Hi, thank you. I'd like to pass. Thanks. <clears throat> right, we're glad you're here. Um, Tom Cecilia. Hi. Um, so I have sort of a two-parter. Um, one is while we're still virtual, and I guess this part still would apply to once we go back to person. It's important that who, whoever's hosting a meeting um, tell the whole story. Um, you know, we need to know um, who's holding the meeting and, and why and how um, the topic that is being commented on fits into the big picture and also how the topic, um, how the comments will potentially change the action. Um, what What's available to be changed? What is not? Um, is it going to be um, just shouting into the wind with the comments or is it, you know, how flexible is the plan? Um, I know it's hard to change um, tack sometimes on big projects, but um, I don't I don't want to have um, comment periods just because comment periods are required. Um, I think the virtual meetings um, are here to stay at least hybrid and I think that we should be doing more of them in the evenings to include more people who have day jobs. Um, I think um, there needs to be an active search for a large enough meeting space that we can have a, a sizable public meeting in person, um, you know, in spring or summer um, and be able to social distance and be safe. Um, I know that um, that's a problem even with HAB meetings now, trying to find a spot that's big enough for everyone at the table and and the peanut gallery and uh, and have social distancing. So, um, you know, that work should be going on now to make sure that in the future, the public meetings can be held in person again. Thank you. Simone, you're new to our midst as well. Would you like to share what's on your mind? still with us? Ah, we must have lost her. Steve Anderson, would you like to participate? Participate. Oh, sure. I, I'd probably just uh, reiterate really um, uh, my earlier comments about, uh, yeah, helping put forth the educational process. And I think uh, Liz's comment on topic, mine was you know, clear subject matter, but yeah, have a topic for our, our meetings. And uh, yeah, to reiterate what Tom said with, uh, you know, how this folds into why it why it's important. So um, yeah, I think educating the public, um, you know, making sure they understand why it's important for them to get involved. As Jerry says, that we just got to use a force of people. Um, and uh, um, so that's, yeah, that's my comment. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Steve Wigman. Steve Wigman. Hmm. So this is always a, a challenging dilemma. Um, I think the, the real challenge is uh, the fact that people are so distracted by living right now and trying to survive that it's pretty hard to reach into them and interest them in our topics. But I think that uh, the, the historical perspective I would offer is that when we went out to malls and talked to people and when we had uh, charts in rooms and we could have open conversations, those things helped a great deal in the informality of communication. And oftentimes we are very formal in our uh, communication and that can be kind of intimidating to folks. And then they have these little snippet of times for public involvement. So 
I think the number one thing I would say is that if we can go back to some of the things that actually worked, that would be a valuable thing to consider. Thank you. Got two more HAB members on my list, and then we will open it up to whoever else would like to jump in. Uh, Tom Galeotto and then Jeff Burright. Tom? Yes, thanks, Ruth. Um, an interesting topic. Uh, I, I interpreted the subject for this uh, um, round robin to be public meetings as opposed to getting more people involved specifically with HAB meetings, so because they're all public. But uh, as far as public meetings go and getting interest, I, I, I'd have you asked for one that I think I have two or three to mention quickly. One is uh, the timing of the meetings for public meetings need to be um, uh, more favorable to the general public being able to attend. And we've not, we've seen in a number of cases where uh, the 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 meeting times and and, uh, and durations really don't facilitate that. So I think that needs to be looked at more. I, I don't have the exact <clears throat> answer to that as to what time is best, but um, timing is an important item to get participation. Secondly, um, it, we've got organizations represented uh, in the HAB, uh, such as Heart of America Northwest and Columbia Riverkeeper and, and a number of others that have organizations behind them that, in fact, from Jerry's comments earlier, have been able to quickly mobilize their interest in his or in his organization's interest in getting comments submitted and in, in other things. Uh, we should be, have the HAB should be able to tap that knowledge and system and uh, process that our organizational members use to build that interest in, within their own organizations. In, in other words, what can we learn from uh, Jerry and Shelley and, and others, other members of the HAB that have organizations behind them that we can use to generate public interest in general. Um, the third thing is you, you generate interest and participation uh, when when there is a, uh, when there is a personal connection. Uh, besides the personal contact in meetings uh, that we've already mentioned here. Uh, but something we, we need to, to structure our um, and announcements of public meetings and our planning in public meetings to to generate the interest of the general public more than we have in the past. Sending out notices on listserv uh, email email list and uh, putting in a uh, I'll say a rather dry uh, announcement in the local paper and that sort of thing is is necessary and I think it's required for public meetings and it's also good, but it's not sufficient. Uh, sufficient would be something that generates a personal involvement of the public that they want to hear covered or they want information on. I don't think we've achieved that. There are ways to do that, but I, I think we, it's something that we can talk about. So the public connection is is and the public personal connection is critical to public participation. Thank you. All right, Jeff, back to you. Um, your option is either to answer the question or open it up to um, others who have joined us today, or both. It's very yeah. prerogative. I, I figured I would close this out, but I don't want to close this out too soon. So I, I would like to open it up uh, if there are others who are here who are, I mean, if you're given your time to be here and you have an opinion, I would love for us to all hear it. Yes, and, and this is Esteban, and I think like it was just shared, one of the big things that I've been noticing, you know, so ever since I think it was announced here and me living in the Tri-Cities, one of the big things is language access, right? Like I think, I believe it was Emmett who mentioned how you got to go to these people, right? And I think Tom mentioned how one of the big things that me working with an organization that's on the west side of Washington doesn't get is people here, man, they work long hours. And second, you know, when you have them to present or educate them on a subject, 
it's limited and it's got to be specific to the point right and you know and it's available for the you know people are aware of the you know the whole way situation what's happening but yet you know are like i think i like soon mentioned are we going to them you know and at the times they're available and it's not your normal times right because some of these people like are either farm workers or work on these packing plants and like here, like, and I think it was somebody mentioned Franklin County. Look, a lot of uh, the employers are like, what Tyson? Imagine the people working at the Tyson, you know, processing plant. What What are those hours? You know, and, and the young crowd. I think you know we got colleges like WSU Tri Cities, Columbia Basin, and other colleges. How are we tapping into those resources of our academics and our institutions out here? You know, because a lot of the young people do just know don't know how to best access this information, and hopefully, I think. Like Steve mentioned, you know, stuff has worked, but how do we evolve and adapt to the changing way to present information and get people involved? Thanks. Roberto, I have you in queue. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I, I was going to touch on what Esteban just mentioned about uh, language access and language barriers. Uh, so uh, thank you, Esteban, for that. Uh, and another thing I wanted to touch on too, uh, this isn't so much as a very uh, tangible answer, but I was recently on a training uh, regarding public participation and it gave me more uh, background knowledge into, into differentiate as to what type of uh, activities uh, we should gear our focus on uh, for public meetings, public hearings, and the sort. And I would love to continue that conversation with uh, the PIC members uh, just to be able to build on that knowledge. And unfortunately, I did not bring any of that material with me because it was very, <laughs> uh, they're about the size of two dictionaries. Um, but uh, hopefully, I can get. Uh, that conversation with you soon. Is that something we ought to put on the books for a future topic, maybe? Uh, perhaps, yeah. Uh, it can be a, a future topic, or, or it can just be a uh, an email form, you know, to see uh, to see <laughs> what what works for everybody uh, else's time. It's Are there others who would like to share their thoughts on increasing public participation, either from the agencies or um, folks who've joined us from elsewhere? Shelly, I see your hand. Thanks, Ruth. Esteban made me, Actually, everybody's got me thinking about other ways of communicating and reaching, and and I and it harks back to when Ken Niles, who was the former director of the Oregon Department of Energy's Nuclear Safety Division, he and I uh, went to a little town in my valley called uh, Embler to the high school to talk to the students there about Hanford. And um, interestingly, as as we got into the discussions and. Um, what really resonated with them was uh, jobs, interest in jobs, and uh, what, so what kind of jobs are there and what kind of education would you need to have? And so it was very interesting to hear uh, those kinds of questions. But also the other thing was the, the pure humanity of it. They happened to have an exchange student from Japan. And... Uh, when they realized that one of the bombs had been developed at Hanford, there was literally a collective gasp from that group. And they turned to him and said, we're so sorry. And the empathy was palpable. And it was so interesting to, to reflect on the humanity and inhumanity of, uh, you know, of our worlds and, and what we need to do to change that. And, so I think that there are other ways of reaching people besides just information dumps um, that, that could be explored. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. 
Uh, you know, I came in with three simple things, but now my brain is full with everything that you all said. Uh, and there are all these connections being built. Yeah, my, my first one was, you need a topic with a hook. Um, and you know, what, what does that mean to have a hook? And we've talked about focusing on the humanity of it, focusing on where it fits in the big picture. Uh, you know, Steve, when he's talking about going to a shopping mall with a poster, I just think, where do you start with someone who just walked by and say, do you have some time to talk about Hanford? Like, how do you how do you start at that most basic level with people? What is that hook? Um, and often, you know, the meetings these days, well, let's talk about the permit modification for LERF ETF. What? Yeah, the, there needs to be a way to connect that to say, we're talking about a piece of our tank waste that has been through the ringer already. And this is the final step before we let it go back into the environment. And here's why this matters. And, oh, what's the tank mission? Well, it's this giant project to, to stabilize something that's really dangerous if it was left alone. And, you know, just this, I don't know, trying to find what is the hook that brings people in that grabs interest. Um, you know, I know that the the impetus of this uh, question was about how to increase participation in public meetings. And I think about public meetings that we've had in Oregon for the Sea Farm Weir. You know, we got 80 people there. Um, and things that grab people are the thought of something that's permanent. So we're talking about final closure of a tank or something that has a an important sounding name like high level waste has an important name and it has important rules behind it that again deal with permanence. Um, people are looking for those things that feel permanent, that feel like real decisions that will bring them out. And it's this, you know, this interim stuff, I think just by its nature is going to grab fewer people. Um, or if it's just kind of a general, let's learn about the size of this problem. I think that's a hook. Our OMSI uh, science pubs that we've given in Oregon, you know, we will we'll pack a theater when it's in person, but also when it's online, we get a much broader audience and there's a long tail to the audience. You know, we had something like 5,000 people over the course, you know, when you spread it out over a month who wanted to just understand the, the nature of the problem. And that brings me to my second point, which is this idea of there is a long tail to public involvement that not everyone is going to be able to show up in that one hour when you're talking about a topic and having an opportunity for people to participate divorced from time from that one hour slot might increase your public participation. And I think about things like email forums. Um, I think about because I use it, you know, the Reddit website and how it allows people to make comments and people later in time to participate in those conversations. Um, our team's chat is an example of that. And are there ways to have a, a longer window of participation for people to ask questions, have conversations? Um, meeting people where they are is something that Emmett has already mentioned, and that was something I was going to bring up as well. Uh, Kate Griffith, who was with us for a short time, uh, she brought that up as well. Of, you know, if you want to engage people, you've got to find out where they are first because they won't always come to you. Um, to the point that Jerry and others made, the public needs to know that it has weight, that that a topic is going to benefit from their participation, um, that there's a clear ability to have feedback. And it might not always mean that they have the power to change a decision, but that they have the access to the decision makers to fully understand the decisions. And I think that's something that the Hanford Regional Dialogues were getting right. And if we can get more people to show up to those, that would be great because I, you know, I'm biased because we helped design that in the pick. But there was so much back and forth, not only with the people at the top, but with the subject matter experts who are very close to the topics to be able to have people who I'd never seen at any Hanford event before come sit face to face with someone in chairs and have 
more than just one back and forth to be able to actually engage in a in an ongoing dialogue and to be able to be a participant and observer to chime in it just felt real uh, and those kinds of opportunities i think are are worth it uh timing you know we i think we're all kind of touching on that that we need to expand beyond these all-day meetings uh, I'm open to people's thoughts on whether these pick meetings are are too cumbersome in the way that we've designed them, uh, and if there are ways we can fix that. Um, so those are those are my big ones. Um, and I would be curious, Jerry, either later today or one on one, why do you think that your outreach effort was so successful? How did you get that many people to care? Uh, I would be curious to to hear your your theories on that. Um, so those were my thoughts. It looks like we've had a few people uh, who want to join in too, and that makes me really happy. Uh, let's hear from them before we go off to break, and and we'll adjust as necessary. I think this is important. Hey, Maya, what's on your mind? Hi. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I was just thinking about kind of public meetings that I had attended and a lot of the times it feels like the the presenter the group that's organized the meeting is just trying to check a box and oh we talked to the public we're done here and try and get it over with and it's really um they they don't use plain language and it's it's very technical it's not like the presentation is clear that it's not designed with the public in mind and that as a member of the public feels really alienating and it's hard to to feel like you should care about something if you hardly understand it or it's really confusing and i feel like each public meeting should be like okay this is our one shot to um to convince the public that this is an important topic and that if we do this correctly then we'll have them coming back for more and so like just reorienting and not thinking like okay we've talked to the public we're done here but like how can we bring them back for a second meeting and how can this meeting be the best that we can do so that they say okay we want to hear more about hanford um so i i don't know if those are I mean, it's more putting it, the onus on the presenter and the person that's that's showing up to the meeting and saying, OK, this is the information that we think is really important. But um, as a member of the public, I would really appreciate just like clear, plain language, being capable of explaining something differently. So not just this one explanation that I have and I'm not able to give you synonyms or like a different kind of a metaphor in, in order to explain it better if there's questions. So kind of thinking of, of coming at it from different angles and really, really caring about like putting the public first would be really nice. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Emmett. Yeah, so all, all this conversation reminds me of um, my career and in educational outreach, of course, you know, we have a captive audience, but one of the one of the concepts that comes to mind is how about a, a waste management soccer tournament or basketball tournament? You know, you and you know, you think about of a captive audience, you can't think about the people that would be there. There would be a lots of people there and it's an informal, it'd be informal where you get you'll be able to talk to a lot of people and formally and meet face to face with them. They do take time to venture into, say, Cinco de Mayo, for example, if you had a booth there. All right. So those are some of the things that would really have people and an informal face to face be able to talk to them. So that's always been a thought of mine. Thank you. You smile. <laughs> Jeff doesn't realize he's also on mute. So right now it's only communication through the smile. <laughs> Sorry. I, I just say I love that. Capitalize on captive audiences. I think that's I think that's fantastic. Uh, 
All right. Uh, and I see that we have a little bit of talk in chat as well. Uh, if we want to bring that into the record and into the fore before we uh, take any last calls and then head out on our break. Gary, do you want to say anything more about um, what you popped into chat? Sorry, the chat keeps popping up instead of the. The chat keeps popping up instead of the ability to unmute. Um, uh, I I think you know in large part where I'm my head is going on the lessons here is captured by or captured by Jeff's point about when we had regional dialogue meetings and a feeling of true engagement, even if there were uh, areas where people felt that they were at odds with the agencies, but they felt engaged. We had 200 people come to meetings in three different cities or four different cities year after year to talk about the need for having a groundwater strategy for Hanford. So in, you know, basically having four, five hundred, six hundred people coming to meetings in each year with the regional dialogue because there was engagement and a dialogue. You can't even begin to generate that type of engagement when your entire list, email list is 1000 people. Um, uh, and if you're not out there actively trying to engage with new audiences, um, I know I'm really pleased that Ecology is working with me you know, and we're looking at how to engage um, with um, students and community members in Mattawa. 95% Latinx community, 70% uh, limited English proficiency, five miles upstream from the Hanford border, the largest city north of on the river and totally ignored from all outreach efforts. Um, and those people who are interested, I'd love to have conversations with offline if people are interested in following up on this with me. Um, but that's the type of thing that you need to be strategic about and think about and say, yeah, let's engage people. Um, and yeah, it's also great to do it at, um, captive where people are captive um, and doing but that is educational effort and you can expect only you know out of every 100 people who you educate at the county fair or in our case recently at um, we were invited by Jackson Brown and James Taylor to have a booth about Hanford cleanup on uh, at their Tacoma Dome concert a month ago and for every 100 people who stop and talk, one or two people will say, oh, I'll follow along. And um, that's how you slowly build that support and understanding. But it's also how you broaden the general public interest. You got to do both. It, you don't call that involvement. That's not involvement, it's education. Involvement is when the couple people who say, I want to start getting engaged and you follow up with them one on one, that's involvement. When a couple of those people sent in comments on five year plan because they looked at a guide out of the 100 people who stopped at a table, that's involvement. Thank you. Last call. Uh, if there's anybody else who'd like to offer some thoughts on the number one idea that could increase public participation, um, you know, this is a thing we should probably check in on regularly because whenever we get new ideas, this is what it's for and people are listening. Um, but not, we'll see if anyone pops in. I just want to say outreach is hard. It's a hard job. It, 
takes a lot of work outside your door, which is sometimes the hardest thing to do is just to go outside your door and to go outside your door in the off hours on on the off chance that you're going to find somebody. I mean, it's it's the, the worst kind of fishing. Uh, and I, I just want to express my appreciation for the people at the agencies, um, the people who are working with the agencies, and you've made this your mission to do something that is really hard. And I just, I want to acknowledge that it is. We're offering advice and, you know, our best guesses as to how to make it more successful, um, recognizing that none of this is easy. Um, and just thanks. We, we wish you great success in, in all of this. Uh, we're a little behind schedule, but it was worth it, I think. Uh, it, I think we have earned a break, though. So if if the public involvement calendar people, uh, with my apologies, if we can wait 15 minutes and then get started on that, um, let's, let's do. Yes, Jeff, I'm here, and uh, I, too, would like a break before we okay. launch into that, too. So thank you. <laughs> All right. 1045. All right. Thank you, everyone. Hello, Ruth. Can you hear me? Hi, Gary. I can hear you. Yeah. What I thought I would do is actually walk through how to find this through the site for our new folks. Oh, I would suggest that. That's fantastic. Oh, so that's. That's why you're actually not seeing it on screen yet. Nope, nope, that's wonderful. Would you like to do that before I even get on? Do you want to just walk them through and then I can hop yeah. in the calendar yeah. is? Yeah, give me like, you know, 25 seconds or something. Sounds great. Roberto. Yeah, uh, Ruth, I just wanted to quickly uh, announce that I have a conflicting meeting with uh, DOE on the five-year review and as soon as the, this section on the public involvement calendar is finished, I'm going to hop off to that. Okay. Yeah, I remember you saying you were double yeah. booked. And then come back here right after in a few okay. hours. <laughs> if only we didn't give you enough to do. If only. <laughs> if only. <laughs> Let's see, are we back? So, Jeff, I'm going to propose that for our new folks, I walk them through how to find this document that they do not have to wait for a PIC meeting to find this information. Sounds good. All right. So, if you go to hanford.gov, you end up on a site that looks like this because, and this is, all things Hanford live on this site, to find the TPA public involvement calendar, you're going to go to this button that says outreach and you get a whole bunch of options, right? And on the left, you see something that says Hanford Advisory Board. You're going to want to snoop that out sometime, but not right now. If you go over to the far right, it says public involvement opportunities. That's what you're looking for if you're looking for the calendar. You get this page and there's a lot of information here, but if you scroll down all the way to the bottom, it says TPA Public Involvement Calendar. Um, it's updated at least quarterly, but I can tell you, Dana and Colleen and some others actually update it sometimes a little more often than that. And it looks like this and it comes in two parts. There are opportunities on the front page and on the second page. I think this is really cool. It actually helps you understand what are the regulatory frameworks within which Hanford works. Things like RICRA and CERCLA and the Triparty Agreement. And yeah, that sounds like a foreign language, but this little table here begins to help unscramble which regulator worries about what stuff? And that's the Cliff Notes version. Dana Gribble is going to give you the understand it version. 
<laughs> well, I tried to make things festive to wish you all a very happy holiday season. I adore working with the HAB and the public involvement and appreciate all of your good ideas and comments and enjoy the public meetings all so very much. And I'm like you, I feel very passionate about what we can do to try to get people more engaged. I realize this is jumping a little bit back to the prior topic, but I think we all wanted a speck of a break. But um, as we brainstorm about ideas about how we can engage and bring uh, people in, I wanted to let the new members know about some things you might not be aware of that we have taken the initiative to do prior to now. Um, depending on the actions, which Ruth just showed you on page um, two, there are various legal requirements, usually involving a comment period, a meeting, and some newspaper advertising, which is required by the Washington Administrative Code, and then various laws apply to various reasons. And so to go above and beyond that, one of the things we've done is we put out monthly media. We go to both the Herald and the Tri-City Journal of Business, and we let the um, reporters and editors know, and they do a good job of publishing these things that are coming up. And we send copy, and we also send images. On top of that, above and beyond the legal requirements, we post to three events calendars, Hanford.gov, which is something you'll all be very familiar with, and of course the events calendars at both the newspapers that I just mentioned. Lastly, we do social media posts for both HAB and the public involvement meetings. They have images, and if you or your groups would take those and share those out when those postings come out on um, the Hanford Facebook page, that would do a great deal to go forward. So especially for those of us who, uh, those of you who are new, we welcome you. And I just wanted to share with you what we're doing that's legally required and then above and beyond. And I always appreciate what the other agencies do, Ecology and EPA, they um, step up and do yeoman's work and getting all of these things approved and posted, um, especially uh, when we have to work with um, all kinds of folks on the local and the national level can be quite a bit of work, but it's very important to us. So I apologize about taking that time, but I just thought I would let folks know that. So thank you. Now, if we just go back here to these um, items, we don't have much here that's not new to you. Uh, many of you have already participated in the WTP um, inspection plan. That public meeting was held November 9th, and that comment period wraps up on uh, December 17th, so the end of this week. But there are still a few days if you'd like to hop on the Hanford.gov events calendar and put some comments in. They are always sincerely appreciated, particularly by yours truly. <laughs> and then um, the 60-day comment period on the uh, decontamination processes for LERF and ETF. We had that public meeting with some of you helping us with that, participating on November 30th. And that one will be wrapping up the week between Christmas and New Year's on December 27th. The draft we're a test bed initiative. That public meeting was held November 18th. There's still plenty of time to get your comments in before that closes on February 2nd. Um, that this gets back to Tom. One of the things you, Tom Cecilia, one of the things you mentioned was the challenges with daytime meetings and this. A couple of our WEIR meetings have been in the daytime to accommodate the DOE headquarters people and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, but I notice with ecology and with the local DOE, we try our level best to have those meetings at night. We start consistently at 530 so people can come, and I agree that daytime meetings during work hours are tough for people to get to, but we do try to have almost all of those at night with the exception of a couple of these. And just to point out on this TP uh, on the test bed on the WEIR test bed initiative comment period, this is a WEIR process just for the first small batch, and there will be a second and similar WEIR process comment period if this works and we're allowed to move more volume and have this be an ongoing process. So, just so you know, this is the first of what might be another similar comment period. And that brings us up to the uh, last two. This one about the 400 area WMU, that title to me is a tad confusing, so I'll cut her into English. 
Many of you are familiar with the Fast Flux test facility. It has a long and rich history here at Hanford that has frustrated many and disappointed some. And people have done their level best with that, but it is now in the process of being dismantled. And so there's an overhead fire protection system that really no longer serves any purpose. This comment period is about removing that from the facility because it's in the way of doing the rest of the take apart decommissioning work. And so we'd love to have your input on that comment period. That's going to be uh, that virtual public meeting is on January 11th after um, the holidays, so there'll be plenty of time for you to participate. The content is already out there. It kicked off December 7th. And lastly, we are to ecology's comment period. So Ryan, would you like to, or Dana, would you like to speak about that? You get Dana. I think Ryan is off to another meeting. He I also is now double and triple booked all the time. Um, so yeah, our ecology, it's a 30 day comment period. It's going to start at the end of January, and this is a renewal of the state waste discharge water permit for the um, treated affluent disposal facility in the 200 area. Uh, we did have a comment period for this earlier in the year and got some comments that made some larger changes, I guess. Um, and so they're going to put it out for another 30 days to get some more comments and let people look at what those those particular changes were. But that right now is the only thing we have on the schedule. Thank you, Dana. And um, we have completed events. Um, there are ongoing comment periods that will be coming up with LERF ETF. Those are straightforward construction projects, and we've already worked through several of those, several more coming up, but we don't have anything that is uh, finalized and gelled enough to bring forward to you at this time. So are there any comments or questions for us? Steve Wigman. Yes, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. There was some discussion earlier about response to comments, and I'm curious, is there any follow up with the public that provided comments on any of these matters that would allow us to understand how the comments are utilized? Uh, that's a very good question, Stephen. So at the end of the comment period, once the comments come in, um, the experts work on producing a response to a comments document. That is posted and it's in the administrative record and I think if we wanted to, we could pull some of that up and go through. I know Tom Cecilia is very knowledgeable about that. I always admire that. And so that's something that we can bring forward to the group to show and discuss. I don't have anything right at my fingertips, but I could dig something up and bring it forward. If you had one in mind you'd like to look at. Not really a specific one. I'm just curious of the, of the effectiveness of public input to these matters. And I know that Tom has posted some of this stuff in places that I don't look. <laughs> so <laughs> some of us, some of us who are getting a little feeble in the brain, need a little help understanding yeah. the follow up process. Yeah, yeah, me too. So yes, um, before any permit is finalized and issued, those comments are responded to and posted in that document. Um, much of this is done through ecology and RECRA, so maybe Dana would rather go ahead and share more information to this, but I can just tell you personally that every time someone makes the effort to write a comment and turn it in, it is taken very seriously. It's heavily discussed, heavily considered, and if you ever feel that that is, your voice is dismissed or not heard, it's just the opposite. You have a a strong say in what can be done and has been done and we'll always be listening carefully and doing all we can to make that better. Uh, it doesn't help us to have something go forward that isn't good and the public has good ideas that you know other folks just might not think about. Dana, did you have any further thoughts to add about the response to comments and those documents and the posting of that? Yes, because um, I, I were <laughs> I work on all the RICRA ones. Um, CERCLA is a completely different world. But yes, the, the RICRA response to comments, as Dana said, they come 
we get the comments and our our permit leads, they respond to them and find, you know, work with DOE to find the best answers. And then we build a response to comments document, which you can actually find on our ecology publications page. Um, they stay up there so that the public has an opportunity to look at them. And if you submitted comments to us electronically, um, and I have an email address for you, I do send out an email letting you know that it has been published and where to find it so that you can follow up on what your comment was. We do have some anonymous commenters, so hopefully they just keep an eye on uh, what's going on because I, I have no way to get a hold of anonymous people. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we do every comment period gets a response to comments. Thank you. Got a number of questions. Tom, Jan, and Liz. Tom? Um, so, yeah, the administrative record can be um, a daunting place to go. Um, if anybody wants to uh, have someone walk through it, I, I check it at least once or twice a week. And um, if you're looking for something, uh, there's some certain keywords you can use. Um, I think. Um, what Steve might have been getting at, and forgive me if I'm wrong, Steve, but there are some comment periods that get opened um, above and beyond the legal requirements, um, such as the five year uh, plan. And just wondering if there's going to be a comment response for that one or, or some of the ones that aren't legally required to have comment responses. On the five year plan, um, I don't know. We'd have to turn to DOE on that. So. Um, and we might have to get back with you. I just don't know off the top of my head, but that's a good question. Gary, do you have any insights on that? Uh, what Dana said, we'll have to get back to you on that. I'm not directly involved in that program, so I, I don't have an answer for that. I do know that our hope and intent with the five year plan was to reach out and do more extensive public engagement to engage new people to get the comments and thoughts back. But yes, Tom, it doesn't fall under any traditional comment period laws. It was a special project that we hope to be an annual special project to do just a better job with our overall priorities, annual efforts and um, how those will be handled. I just haven't heard and don't know, so I apologize, but we will report back once we ask. Thanks. Gladly. I have Liz and Steve. Jan, Liz and Steve in queue. Jan. Uh, good morning. Um, I really don't have a question. I was just signing in to let you know that I had arrived. So thanks very much. Yay. Jan is here. Um, Liz, question. Yeah, and I I'm, I'm apologize if I missed it. Um, I noticed in, I think it's in the response to our advice. There was reference to the five-year uh, five-year update of the tri-party agreement within the next year. Um, can you talk about that? Is does it have a public comment period? Um, there's reference to the central plateau um, principles and parameters document being because it's a part of the TPA now. Um, potentially, it could be updated during that public comment period. So I, I just have no memory of a TPA five year review and maybe I just don't remember it. But if you could talk about that um, uh, and give some context, that would be great. Thanks. Yes, we, we do have a um, five year review. Um, it's Mike Klein who usually takes the lead on that. Um, I can find that and drop that in the email box what's been done in the past. but. As far as anything pending or coming up, I haven't been working on anything, so I'm not up on anything that might be coming out. Is there anyone else on the line who might know more? And when we're done, I will Google what's been done in the past and drop it in the chat to share with you. It's on hand for DOGGOV. Glad to help. Roberto. Uh, just to, uh, not to cut uh, Steve, uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, but just to chime in on the five year review process. So that's currently ongoing and there's <laughs> currently a meeting with Dewey, uh, my client and uh, others uh, to go over the EPA's comments on that. Um, 
my understanding of the process is that DOE is still processing the comments that they have received from uh, everyone so far as of this moment. So that draft is currently uh, in process. Um, that's the most, uh, that's the best information I can give right now. Uh, Liz, okay. if you had anything else that you wanted to add on to that? I guess I'm, I'm I know it's, and I'm, I'll clarify this maybe for everyone because it's confusing because there's the circle of five-year review, there's the five-year plan for Hanford cleanup, and now there's this five-year tri-party agreement update review. So you're talking about the tri-party agreement update review that has some comments but is in review? Um, the one I'm talking about is the CERCLA five-year review, and I just dropped the link into the chat to show you okay. what's... This Roberto, is please check and make yeah. sure we're talking about the same thing. That's the one you're talking about that your agency right. is I know working. about. Yeah, I know about the CERCLA five-year review. This was in the, um, in the response to our advice. And maybe, Jeff, you want to jump in? So, yeah, I just know about so, Go ahead. Um, I've just pasted an image of the response to our advice. And I've highlighted the phrase that Liz is asking about here, uh, where it says the TPA agencies will be considering revisions to this document, meaning the central plateau principles and parameters over the next year as a five year review of the tripartite agreement is conducted. And that was from October of this year. So presumably there's something happening and, and that's what we're just trying to understand. Well, um, that I interpret that to be this CERCLA five-year uh, review, but I agree with these words that the word CERCLA is not in there. So again, I hate to be dumb and dense, but I don't want to say something inaccurate, so I'll have to make a note and get back to the group on that. But I, as far as I know, there's the CERCLA five-year review and then the five-year plan. And so I don't believe there's a third five year anything going on to the best of my knowledge, but I have been wrong before. <laughs> we may have to bring that up then later today when we talk about the response to our advice and whether there actually is a, a public opportunity to look at the principles and parameters, you know, how and when they ever get updated. Because if this isn't accurate, then we need to, I guess, understand where the opportunity does lie if, if it exists. Um, so sorry, that's a sorry, hint for those of you who want to do homework over lunch. The question might come up this afternoon. We will, we will take a look. All right, so Jeff and Tom sort of had the same thing on the mind, so we're at Steve Wigman. Thank you, this, this conversation is very helpful to me my my comment on how comments are responded to is kind of directed at if we have a better understanding of how public input is utilized it might help us understand better how to inspire more public input and just being able to find it somewhere doesn't help some of us the conversation is what helps me the most. So we don't have to do it now, but I would just like to suggest that we have more conversation about how the public input is utilized so that we can see where the impact is positive or negative or whatever it is or where it's ignored um, so that we have a better context for reaching out. And that was really what I was hoping we could do at some point. Uh, Liz. Um, yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Steve, about how we round back with people. I think there's there's multiple pieces to it. Um, but when you were just talking, it gave me an idea. Um, usually, I mean, I feel like one big challenge is you comment on something and then you don't see the response to comments document until maybe a year later, sometimes two years later. And then you can't even remember what you commented on. Or you're like, did I comment on that? Let me go look. Um, most people are not going to take the time to do that. Um, that's why there's groups like Hand for Challenge and Heart of America and Columbia Riverkeeper and other groups that try to translate that stuff. Um, but even for us, 
if our calendar and communications calendar is really full, it's hard to get that message out. So for the M91 um, change package, I'm pretty sure that's the TPA change package for miles M91 around, um, I'm pretty sure that's right here anyway. Um, we, I did put a whole thing together to share with our listserv about that and we just haven't had time to send it out. Um, I think the frustrating thing, because we did get, you know, as soon as it came out, I got the email that that response to comments document was ready and then I had to go back and look, what did we even say? Um, <laughs> it, it's complicated I, and I'm not, I know I'm not alone on that. Um, but I feel like part of the frustration too is like, well, if my comments didn't change it, then why did I comment? It was a, con a conversation we have a lot. Um, and I think part of it, it might not be satisfying, um, is that you're showing up and paying attention is a, in itself a comment, like your presence and voice is a comment, even if it doesn't change some decision between the tri-party agencies that took a long time for them to reach that agreement. Um, and I can understand why that's hard for the agencies if it took a year to get to agreement about changed milestones and the public says, we hate your milestones, change them. And they're like, eh, sorry. Um, there's That dynamic is challenging, obviously. And by showing up and continuing to show up, there is a, a presence in the public continuing to show up and saying something, paying attention. Um, but there is a, a problem to solve with these how you share those response to comments. I think this kind of gap we've been talking about directly and indirectly around just general topic public meetings potentially could be something that there's maybe a format that's like, okay, let's go over the, you know, maybe even a quarterly public meeting. What decisions were reached in the last quarter were there any response to comment documents that came out? What were they? Where the agencies kind of go over that um, so that it's summarized and isn't just a one-off or you're you're not only getting that communication if you commented. Um, there might just be an opportunity there to, to represent or repackage that information and bring it to the public and also kind of demystify some of the decision-making process. Um, I know this is hot on the holistic negotiations topic as well, where there's this closed door, lots of conversation behind that closed door, what's happening back there, and is there a mechanism um, to reach out to the public before those decisions are made, before that hard fought negotiations happening. So you know the input you put in, you put your input in, now the process is off and running, and you know your input informing those negotiations. I think that is a piece that is missing um, and I don't know the, the answer necessarily, but I think there's space to talk about that, how to make that happen. Anyway, sorry, that was long-winded. Well, just a quick question. So I'm clarifying, um, taking talks out of the holistic negotiation space and getting it to the public, I'm not thinking that can happen from legal reasons, but I'm not a lawyer. But the idea of bringing up forward um, quarterly what's happened, is that something you'd like to add to your pick agenda? Because I think any response to comment documents that had been produced within a quarterly period could come on this agenda and be talked through. That seems doable. I, I will say yes, that would be fantastic, um, especially if part of the pick is to review these kinds of outputs. I think it would be helpful for all of us to look at a comment response document and see what it looks like and what the tone is and look at whether the comments are resolved. Um, I think it would be great. It would also be neat to track the the outstanding comments that are still awaiting a response. For example, the Sea Farm Weir, we submitted comments in October of 2018, and I'm still waiting for the comment response on that one. And then I understand it's taking its its time. Um, yeah, I think that would be a really interesting future topic, and it would get at what Steve was talking about too, I think. I'll also um, 
before I overspeak, as you well know, I'm just a contractor. And so much of these response to comment documents ultimately come through ecology and RECRA. And of course, DOE would need to make these decisions. So Dana, um, anyone else have any other thoughts? That was just to seemed like a reasonable thing to put on the agenda for pick in the future if you wanted to. It's not like those aren't out on the AR in the public. Um, it's not hard to Google that and pull it up for you. Uh, this is Dana. We can, I mean, if you guys want to add it to the agenda, I don't. It seems, <laughs> I just finished the uh, T plant CWC response to comments, which is, I think it was 433 comments. So it might be ambitious to go through all the comments during a pick meeting, um, but <laughs> so most of them aren't that long. Uh, but you know, sometimes. Uh, but definitely to you know bring awareness to which ones came out and if there were because a lot of times there's like one subject that many people commented on, and you know a discussion about what the impact of that one particular topic might be that I could see where that would be helpful informational yeah That'd and they good. are they're published once they're published anybody can look at them you know however they want to look at them yeah. I I have to admit I don't know where to find responses to comments um, I don't know if there's a, I think Brian, a link to be Brian posted. posted the link in the chat did he oh did I miss it yeah it's up there at 1059 he posted it and that takes you to our nuclear waste publications and we have um, it's like the last two years are active on there and any ones you want oh. before that you can just email me and I'll send you we take them down because of space great okay um, yeah. I, I can certainly get a, if there's older ones that people need just email me and I'll I can get them to you not a problem Thanks. It'd be it'd be great if the non ecology stuff on the site had something like this where it was just all in one place. That's really nice. Um, yeah. Josh, can you make sure you put that link in the, the minutes? Can do. And just so people know our also our focus sheets. So the mailers that we send out prior to the beginning of the comment period, those are also on our publication page. So you can, you know, see from, you know, the at the beginning of a comment period, it's listed on our public comment, open comment period page. But if you want to look at something historical, the the focus sheet is on there also. So a general observation that's coming to my mind is I'll read the comment response documents that are between DOE and ecology. I know it's a totally different dynamic because ecology is the regulator, but it's amazing how many go rounds there will be as the Department of Energy tries to seek satisfaction from ecology that ecology's comment has been adequately resolved. Uh, and just the observation that the public comments don't get that same um, seeking of satisfaction. And I would be curious what the the rating of satisfaction would be if, if people read the the eventual responses to their comments. Mm. Are there any other uh, questions, thoughts related specifically to the TPA public involvement calendar? Jeff, I suggest we move to reflections. Um, I, <laughs> I'm not totally comfortable saying this, but uh, the facilitation team really needs to break at 11:30 for the 90 minutes. Given how many meetings are this week, we're actually booked over lunch. Understood. Um, well, thank you, Dana. Thank you, Dana, uh, for bringing us good stuff as always. Um, and being so open to talking with us and answering questions. All right, um, so we do have kind of a, a short window here, but we can bring up some things later as well. Uh, if people have just burning reflections 
on meetings that you've been a part of since the last time we had a PIC meeting, uh, which was September. So um, not a ton of meetings, but if you have any real burning thoughts there, I would like if we have any updates from Department of Energy or other agencies about where we stand on future meetings and timeline for opening back up uh, in person and whether there are any updates related to hybrid meetings. Uh, we might not have time here, but I, I do want to make sure we talk about that today. Um, I see Liz, go ahead. Thanks, Jeff. Um, my only comment is on the LERF, ET, the um, liquid effluent retention facility, uh, effluent treatment facility, decontamination, permit modification, public meeting. The comment period ends on December 27th. I'm going to put our comment guide in the chat. Um, so we've been making comment guides for the permit mod. Comment periods are pretty rough, I think, for everyone. But I was just, um, this was a particularly rough public meeting. Um, Mia was referencing it earlier, I think, in, in her comments um, about improving public meetings. I, I don't know how many of the people on this call were attending that. It was on, I think, the 30th of November. Um, and, you know, none of these comments are personal. I know this is a, a rough space, and I would love to have more context for how how restricted translating technical information is in these meetings. If there's a script that presenters have to follow, and if they deviate from that script, they get in trouble, or what the story is. But it, it took us a long time to understand what was meant by um, the decontamination of the LERF basins meant removing waste codes. Um, that line was used over and over and over again, and just so many questions it took to get to that actual, um, what that meant was taking water, liquid effluent that had gone from the basins through the effluent treatment facility the water is clean, it could go to the state approved land disposal site, or it could be used to flush the basins before new waste is introduced. So simple to explain that. And it took so long. It was, I, I, I would love to understand if there's some barrier there. Or present, I mean, it must be frustrating as a presenter to not be able to say things um, that plainly. Um, anyway, I would love to figure out how to solve that, how to support making these meetings more accessible. Um, I've been working on Hanford for 14 years. Susan Lockband was at that meeting. We had no idea what they were talking about. Um, so I, I can just see if you're new to the, if you're a member of the public and you were attending that meeting, I cannot imagine anyone was following it. Um, and I put our, our um, say what guide in the chat just for reference. Um, we tried to break it down and explain how LERF and ETF work learned a lot in the process of trying to explain it. So it might be useful for HAB members because we haven't talked about those facilities a ton, just a little bit in Tank Waste Committee. Um, but if there's a way, and I don't know how to structure this conversation without just being this broken record of like, please make it more accessible, kind of waiting for the next public meeting. Oh, that wasn't super accessible. Please make it accessible. Like it just feels like this loop. And if we're missing something, if having the meetings not recorded would make them more accessible, I am up for trying things, but um, that was just a rough one. So thanks and really nothing personal to the presenter. I'm sure they were doing their best and um, following the rules that were set. I, I would just love to figure out how we can make those meetings really um, understandable to people who are attending. Thanks. Other folks who want to jump in? Uh, yes, this is Dan Solich. Um, yes, the DOE uh, Department of Nuclear Energy has put out a request for information for consensual siting. How that relates to us is that eventually we're going to be looking for a deep geologic disposal for our high level waste. And this is kind of a tentative first step, although they, they can't site an interim until Congress acts, and when Congress acts, hopefully they'll address the uh, 
the uh, deep geologic disposal consensual siting too, but it'll be a similar process, and DOE is kind of getting a head start on that with the interim siting. I have a different opinion of them as the necessity or even the value of that, but it's a process that I think we should sort of take an interest in as we're going to need a home for that high-level waste glass, and this is kind of a tentative first step towards that. Uh, it's they're, they're all new young people, and I think they're kind of relying on the old Robert Ross's boom ba, nuclear power way to go uh, script. And I think DOE is kind of making a mistake with it by not taking a more intellectually rigorous approach to the whole the whole subject. So if you've got an interest in the long term, you might follow that uh, request for information on and and comment on on uh, how consensual siting should be uh, uh, done. Thanks, Dan. I've added that to our list of potential future topics. If there's anybody from the, the DOE headquarters effort who sees benefit in taking some time to talk to us about how they think about designing that process. Um, you know, since Hanford was once considered as a site for that, uh, I think there is potentially some intersection there. Um, I'd just be interested um, to know how they're doing it. Uh, I'll offer just a couple of observations from the the waste incidental to reprocessing public meeting that happened for the test bed initiative. And that's a big old mouthful, but um, we had Department of Energy, Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, coming on to talk about the process that they're going to go through to evaluate whether tank waste can be re or classified as not high level waste such that it could be disposed uh, as grout uh, offsite somewhere. Uh, I thought that it was really nice to have it in the team's atmosphere rather than what we had in prior meetings, only because it allowed me to see who was at the meeting as well as it had the open chat and those are things that we had uh, recommended in our uh, virtual public meeting advice and it was just they're simple structural things i wonder if it was the change over the over of the contract finally allowed the use of different tools um, but i'm just speaking for myself uh, those were some nice things to see and i appreciated it um, the meeting was shorter than i think anyone probably guessed it would be uh, it was pretty pretty straightforward and I think that DOE and NRC by now this is their third or fourth weir process that they've initiated for Hanford they seem like they've got their their routine pretty well figured out for how to introduce these topics um, and I remember back for sea farm it was the first one and it really did take three hours because you had a parade of subject matter experts who came and really explained the contents of the evaluation itself and we didn't have that this time around uh, to my recollection unless i'm misremembering and if i am please forgive me um, or maybe it's just that straightforward where it didn't take the hours and hours of discussion of what it all means um, but it, it felt like a very streamlined meeting i wonder if it was uh, surprising to those who designed the meeting too how much shorter it was than the time it was planned for it um, and then just the, you know, can't escape saying it, it was double booked with our last pick meeting and that's why we're meeting today. And that was a bummer. Um, and I, I hope we take a look at the HAB calendar next time around. Um, but I understand there are a lot of people that you're trying to coordinate for those meetings. Um, if there are any other reflections on recent public meetings, we have about three minutes left. Uh, jump in the queue. Otherwise, I'd like to ask Gary, are there any updates uh, regarding the future of in-person meetings? Is now a good time to talk about it or should we, is it a longer topic that needs more than just a few minutes? Well, the update that I have, Jeff, is I have no update right now. Okay. 
every, everything is still conditions based. And while we hope that sometime next year we can see each other in 3D, um, I don't have any updates beyond that. Hope and prayer. And that's not going to take us very far. I did see in the weapons complex monitor, gosh, a couple of weeks ago, that DOE is starting the process of bringing people back to the office starting in like February, right? That there are like waves happening. There are plans, but like I said, everything is conditions based. COVID has a, a, a say in everything that we do. And Omicron is out there whispering. So uh, conditions based. Okay. All right. Well, I guess my proposal would be we shouldn't let that stop us from designing how we want to return once we all have the green light. And I think that that still gives us some opportunity this afternoon to talk about what kind of a welcome back we want to make. Um, so thank you. Any other thoughts from folks uh, on recent meetings before we take a break for lunch? Well, my clock just ticked over to 11.30, so I think we are right on time. Thank uh, you. Thank you for your understanding about lunch. It's it's just one of those weeks. Yep, uh, it is. It's a busy week. Totally understood. Uh, we'll see you all. What time are we getting back together? Is it one? One o'clock. All right. We'll see you all then. Thank you. So, so while, while we are waiting for, oh, go ahead, Jeff. I was just going to recommend uh, in the chat, there are links to the advice that we put forward as a board, as well as the response from the agencies. Uh, if you haven't read them both yet, um, please do so in the time that we're taking to get set up here. The other thing I wanted to show new folks is if you don't have Jeff Verite on speed dial to give you those links, um, I will show you on. If you go to Hanford.gov, we did this one more time once before, and you're looking for past HAB advice or past agency responses to HAB advice, at Hanford.gov, if you go into Outreach, go down to Hanford Advisory Board, and it's going to take you to this page that has all kinds of information about the board. It has things on past board products, meeting information for committees, for the board, points of contact. Um, the third one down is advice and responses. And you're going to see all 310 pieces of advice. And so when you hop down, you can see the advice letters themselves here in this column, all hot linked, and responses to advice in this column. So if you click on the advice, it's going to pull up that letter. So you can read it, you can download it, you can print it, um, whatever you would like to do. And responses, and then similarly, you can get the responses. So quick way to, to find those if you don't have them handy in an email or a link from Jeff. Jeff, you want to take us into this? Uh, sure, yeah. I'm writing a list of thoughts here. Uh, so the first part of the topic, thought that we would take the opportunity since we did put together some advice. It was a significant effort from all of us over many hours and many months. 
uh, and we did receive a response from the agencies. This is our opportunity to reflect on the advice that we put out, the response that we got from the advice and kind of a where should we go from here question. Uh, we don't often, at least in my time here, I haven't seen us do a lot of this reflecting on how how we've done and what the exchange has been like. Thought it would be a good opportunity to do so. Uh, but beyond that, thinking again about what we talked about this morning with regards to how do we improve public involvement? And if we're lucky and next year allows us a change uh, to some sort of hybrid style meeting, some sort of, uh, is there an opportunity here to mark the occasion with a, you know, welcome back to Hanford. Here's what you missed while we were all in this weird place. Here are some of the big uh, decisions that are being made or being considered. Here are some of the foundational aspects of the Hanford cleanup. And we wanted to let you, the public, know how you have been involved, how you can be involved in these things, but also to take it as an opportunity to solicit feedback from the public about how we slash they want to be involved in some of these larger things that are happening right now because there are a lot of big movements that are happening under the water um, and so let's start a specific example i'll bring some ideas out there and how might the agencies best engage the public um, in a, a welcome back to Hanford type of conversation? I'm sorry, my internet's going a little poorly here. So first piece of all of this, let's open the floor to thoughts, reflections on the advice and the response. Anyone? <clears throat> oh, part of our challenge. I'll let an awkward silence hang for a while. I'll do it. I promise. All right, Tom, go ahead. Um, I, when I first read through the uh, response, I was um, really excited that there was a five-year TPA review coming up, um, and uh, you know, wanted to get that sort of holistic picture. And uh, you know, based on this morning's conversation, I'm not sure if that's actually a thing, but um, if it is, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, being engaged there. Gary? Yeah, I apologize. I was busy fumbling around with uh, keys here. Uh, Tom, to your question, there is actually a, a TPA five-year review, and it's actually uh, in process right now. I, I have nothing to add beyond that, uh, but it is a thing, and it's being talked about, and that's as much as I know. So clarifying question for... I don't know if it's Gary or Roberto who's the right one, or David even, <clears throat> is the TPA five-year review the same or different than the CERCLA five-year review? Yeah, I can answer that. The TPA five-year uh, review or update is different, is different from the CERCLA five-year review.
because we've talked about so many reviews today. I'm <laughs> if I'm confused, somebody else must be confused too. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I would also confuse with that. Oh, I was sorry, Shelly. Um, I guess I what I'm I, I was confused and that was gonna be my question. So thanks for asking it, Ruth. I'm really curious then. So what is the process for the five year review? And is there public the need for or desire for uh us to weigh in or the public for that matter? Regarding the as a general uh, circular five-year five -year review process. Um, there is some uh, community involvement, but when it comes to the site-specific, or rather the Hanford-specific, that uh, because it's under a federal facility agreement and led by DOE, uh, that is being done by DOE. So I guess we need to be clear. We the circle of five, the circle of five year review has uh, there's a draft out and um, DOE is leading the, the charge as far as comments. Is there a comment process on the TPA five year review? From my understanding, um, well, at least from my awareness, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I can ask uh, our uh, EPA's representative to see, you know, what uh, what they know, and I'll get back to you on that. But uh, I don't know if the other agencies have uh, anything else to add on to that. So I have a question about this. So um, is it your understanding that this? I, I mean, I'm hearing that there's a TPA five year review, but we also know that we are governed under the FACA Act, and I'm wondering if the five-year review is part of the uh, necessary processes specified by FACA for all the site-specific advisory boards really kind of outside the tri-party agreement, or whether this five-year review is specified in the TPA agreement that um, you know, where the state of Washington and EPA are signatories. Um, I'm going to start a new document because we now have more than one review we're dealing with. We have a circle of five year review, which is different than a TPA five year review, which is actually different than the two year cycle under the Federal Advisory Committee Act for re-upping charters for federal advisory committees. And I really didn't mean to cause confusion. But. And does does anybody know for sure what, you know, which one of these reviews we're talking about? Jan, that's a good question. I, I don't think we are clear, and I think that that's what this conversation is revealing. You know the the essential why of why are we talking about this right now is that there was a reference in our advice in the response to the advice to a five year review of the tri party agreement document and the reason that matters is that we have this central plateau principles and parameters document that the board was interested in having an additional public comment opportunity in having some additional outreach to the board about it. Um, and the response from the agencies was, well, we're going to be opening up the whole TPA document for a five year review. And now that the Central Plateau Principles is an appendix inside that tri-party agreement, that would be your opportunity to talk to us about how you feel about this document that just got added to the TPA. What but it of seems course, we're discovering but now. But of course, is what we're looking for, what we're really looking for is um, what is the uh, what document uh, governs this review? That's all we want to see. We want to be able to read it. I mean, somebody is working off of a document that um, may or may not be um, a part of the original TPA. Maybe it's been amended. We just don't know. I expect that there are people on the HAB 
who are familiar with the TPA agreement to the extent they would know whether there's a five-year review as part of their understanding of TPA. So, um, you know, as we embark on this process, I think it's really important for us to be able to see what is the, um, the purpose and the means by the, which this is going to be accomplished and what are the goals. So, um, you know, the, these are all good things to know. And if they're embarking on this, on this review, then there has to be a document. Yeah. I'm Cecilia. Yeah. I think I think Jerry had his hand up first. Oh, did he? Oh, I, I'm sorry, Jerry. I missed it. Um, you go, and then Tom. Uh, I would start with the disappointment that we have extensive discussions in this committee and the full board, in which the agencies say, uh, say we understand what your points are and your the brunt of your advice is about broad public involvement in major strategic planning decisions and setting strategic plans. That was the focus of our advice. We had a lot of discussion and that's why I wanted to start with this, this issue this morning because then we receive the response to advice. And I would point out that the response to advice actually never responds to our urging that there be a major regional public involvement effort on strategic planning. Nothing, it's ignored. And I think the agencies, you should you know, try to explain why you would ignore that. And it's not an answer to say, hey, at the bottom, we look forward to, you know, um, you know, you give us a plan, we look forward to it. Why would we do that when you can't even commit to saying, hey, we agree there should be a visioning process. We would want to move ahead um and we're committed to doing so from this advice it doesn't sound like you're committed to doing so but we could spin our wheels for another year asking that's the response as i read it and secondly i i this i I'm dumbfounded at the fact that the TPA agencies will include information about changes to the document during public involvement activities for the five-year review when there are no public involvement activities for the five-year review. How could you write that? Um, Jerry, are you looking for an answer or are you being rhetorical? Yeah, I'm, I am looking for an answer. I mean, I'd like to know, and that's the point of the dialogue. <laughs> is this answer supposed to be intended to say, we want to work with you, we're interested in having that regional effort on strategic planning? Is that what you intended to say or not? because it sure isn't clear. And the second question is, I, what in the world are you committing to, are you or are you not committing to a public involvement effort on the five-year review, which is now we understand totally different from a circle of five-year review? All right, Jerry, this is David. I'll do my best to answer your question. I, I'm i still learning about all these different documents, and as you can tell from this conversation, there's three or four different five, three-year, two-year reviews going on all at one time. 
I have no way of knowing exactly all the details of every one of those at this point in my tenure here. Um, I was looking through my email real quick to see, you know, we do have the TPA five year review <clears throat> and it was just getting kicked off here this week as far as planning to figure out what we're going to do. Um, as I went through my email, I also noted that part of the five year review is about the budget piece that um, everybody asks about and the disclosure of additional information being more transparent, etc. Um, so I can't, I don't know specifically what the process is for public involvement in the TPA five year review versus the circle one. And what I can do though is um, get with John Price and we can bring a presentation to the HAB on these items or something like that, um, if that's at all useful for the, for the board and try and make sense of all the different moving parts because there are too many of them in my head to give you a, a definitive and clear answer, unfortunately. Well, thank you, David. I mean, do you under see why it would be frustrating for us to get an answer where we can't even tell if the agencies are willing to commit to doing a, you know, a public involvement planning, uh, excuse me, public involvement process regionally on strategic plans? Because that was the brunt of the advice. We spent months discussing it, and I we get this and I can't tell what the answer is and I'm pretty sure no one can. No, nope, that's fair, Jerry. I, I see it. Thank you. Thank you. Do either of the other agencies have something to add to responding to Jerry's questions? Yeah, uh, although this may not uh, directly answer Jerry's uh, question, uh, although I do hope it does provide some clarity. Um, I just reached out uh, to our um, rep for the TPA five year review. Um, and it seemed that there is some understanding that uh, that there will be some change control forms uh, agreed to by the parties that will eventually go out to public comment in some form. Uh, an exact date, uh, not exactly sure. Uh, it will uh, at this point likely happen uh, next year, considering this is what we're nearing the end of 2021. Um, but that's the information that I have right now. Just respond that the legal requirements for notice and comment on a proposed change to the TPA is really different than a public involvement effort that is aimed at a comprehensive five year review. So if you don't agree between each other to modify something, but it might be important for the public to be part of a discussion where we might influence whether or not some provision should be revisited, we're just left out because you've only decided to, you know, um, modify provision milestone 91-H27 and the public might be interested in whether or not the entire Milestone 91 series should be changed as part of a five-year review. Thanks. Right. Let's go to Gary and then circle back and make sure we pick up Tom. Gary? Sure. I just wanted to uh, go along with Roberto that there is a component uh, for public comment for the uh, uh, TPA five-year review. I don't know enough about that process to go beyond that, but there is a uh, comment component. I apologize for not being able to go beyond that. Switching gears to the CERCLA five review, uh, CERCLA five-year review, uh, DOE and EPA are passing comments back and forth right now, and we have tentative plans to discuss that uh, what, once the document is uh, much closer to being able to uh, get wrapped up. I think we're looking at potentially uh, in the springtime. 
uh, more on that uh, when we have more information available. So there is going to be an attempt to uh, uh, bring something forward for the public. Uh, what that form will be, I'm not as involved in, in those processes, uh, <clears throat> so I I don't know what that that uh, involvement will look like. But uh, when we get more information, I'll be happy to share. Okay, so now I've got folks in queue. I've got Tom, Cecilia, Jeff, Shelley, and Tom Galliotto. Did I miss anybody? Tom, Cecilia? Yeah, so um, I just wanted to follow up with what Gary was saying. We did request a brief um, in, in the last wrap meeting um, on the five year circular review. Um, if you look at 2017 as an analog, um, which was the last five year circular review and the last five year TPA agreement review. Looks like Mike Klein gave presentations uh, on the circular in spring and this one that Ryan just posted um, on the TPA in June. So maybe we should, you know, pencil that in on the calendar if we can and try to keep to that schedule if it's at all possible, just so there's something, some certainty. Yes, Tom, I, I am working with Mike, and he's the one who says uh, probably in the springtime. So as soon as we get something uh, that, that's a little bit more firm than Jello, uh, I'll let you know. Yeah, and then Shelley. Yes. Thanks. Uh, maybe people can remember better than me, but there was a piece of this where we were also asking for a, a specific briefing on the central plateau principles and parameters for the board to understand what was in it, what the results of the HAB input from six years ago actually led to. Uh, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we took it out of the advice because it was understood that that was something that the board wanted to see. And I understand that RAP has got a very full plate trying to figure out where to fit it in. I wonder, though, related to that, which of these five year reviews is the one that could potentially open up the central plateau principles and parameters if there was a, you know, a good reason to do it? Is it the CERCLA five year review or the TPA five year review? And then related to that, would a briefing on this new addition to the TPA be appropriate? as something to bring out to the public as part of this five-year review process if you are soliciting public comments give the public something to work with and say here are the things that we've changed in the last five years here are the things that we're considering changing over you know now that we're at this five-year mark and using that as an opportunity to again give the public an opportunity to have some weight in the process um, so just yeah trying to figure out where where this fits. Um, I'll also say that you know we've been trying to talk about in-state visions and all of that for a couple of years now and you know this last point from the agencies um, you know we're we're looking for it. Um, I, I hope we get there. I uh, I think I was generally I, I was a little disappointed with the the response that we got, it just felt like, you know, we had a pretty specific thing we're looking for. And I don't know that I felt like that thing we were looking for was like, yes, we get it. We we want you to have that thing you're looking for. I I hope that the the very first bullet where the values expressed in advice points one and two are also the TPA agency's values, maybe that does cover it. Uh, and I, I guess the proof will be in the pudding when there are future foundational documents, um, what the public process looks like there. So, thanks. I have Shelley and Tom Galliotto. Shelley? Thanks, Ruth. Thanks, everybody. Um, gosh, you know, I sometimes I think I know what I know, and then I find <coughs> out, oh, no, <laughs> at all. And uh, it's, it's not clear. And so when I look at CERCLA in the five-year review, what, you know, what I see is a process where we're looking at remediations that have been completed and whether they are holding and whether we need to go back in and open them up and, and, uh, and uh, search for other solutions. 
Um, is the TPA five-year review an administrative five-year review where you're actually working through the document? I, I guess I don't understand the scope of the TPA five-year review. And I'd like to understand that. Um, um, so that it would give me a better sense of what it's something, whether it's something that we would potentially want to weigh in on. Um, so I guess that's a question I have. No one needs to answer it right now, but I'd like to hear an I'd like to hear an answer. I'd like to under I'd like to understand the scope of it. Thanks. And Shelly, that's kind of what I'm digging into as well. Um, I'm making notes so I can make sure I follow up because I, you know, the TPA itself is a legal agreement between three agencies, and I know it was, I know it was drafted with a lot of input from a lot of people. But at the end of the day, the agencies made those decisions. So I don't know, like if, like you said, it's administrative <laughs> things that need to be updated, made consistent, or things that just aren't working need to be changed, or if it's supposed to be a strategic change to the to the document. So I will be researching that. Thanks. I, I feel, I guess I'm overwhelmed by COVID or something. I don't know. I can't think back five years to, well, you know, what was the last TPA five-year review about and what did we say or did we say anything or did we even know that it was, you know, entertained by the agencies and completed? Um, it's kind of a, it's kind of a black box for me. So it would be great if we could understand that uh, as a, as a board. But also for this committee, and what the you know what the public uh, comment or involvement component might be. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Dick. All right, Tom Galliotto, you had a specific question about the response letter, right? Yes. Uh, my my comment is fairly simplistic. I, looking at the last response bullet on DOE's uh, responsiveness advice. It talks about uh, DOE requesting uh, to, I'm sorry, am I, I guess I'm getting, I guess I'm getting an echo here. Anyway, uh, the agent, it says the agencies regularly conduct um, workshops and visioning processes on Hanford cleanup end states, and they reference uh, two advice items, 132 and 151, were, which were dated and issued in 2002 and 2003. That doesn't sound too regular. Um, I'm sure there were other activities that uh, have involved end state reviews, but, and I haven't looked for those and I, I can't recall any very recent ones. So I, I think that that response is rather misleading. Thank you. Other vote? <clears throat> Don't have others in queue at the moment. Jeff, where do you want to go from here? Well, I don't think we need to write another thing. Um, I would hope that the conversation that we're having here today can help the agencies process our processing um, and understand where we would still like to go. Um, the conversations that we are still eager to have that when there are documents that are foundational, such as the Central Plateau Principles, because it's you know one of the most recent ones, uh, and things like the holistic negotiations and whatever is going to come out of that. Um, lots of the decision documents on the, the corridor, the river corridor and the plateau, you know, all these things that, that add up to quite a lot together. Uh, we're looking for involvement there. Um, and specifically for the central plateau principles, you know, to me that that ink still feels kind of wet. And I hope that there is an opportunity in the next year to get a full briefing on what happened in the six years since we were last involved in that 
um, how it all shook out to the final and what it means for the end state, because it really is, I mean, it's setting the end state by deciding what the cleanup goals are and what, what you're shooting for. And especially as attention turns to the central plateau, now that a lot of things are kind of starting to feel settled on the river corridor, if I'm putting words in mouths, please forgive me, um, that it's, you know, it's worth, worth talking about. And I think understanding, getting some clarity uh, on what are the five-year reviews, what is their scope, and kind of to the second half of this topic, what part does the public play? What are we allowed to to look into and dig into, and where can our comments actually affect um, the agreements between the agencies? I think would be helpful um, as you get into those reviews and as you design what your public process is going to be for those reviews. Just make it really clear for us you know, where we fit. Gary. Uh, thank you. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm also looking at that last uh, bullet of, of the advice response. And one thing that, that would be helpful is that last sentence is the agencies would be interested in more specific recommendations intended to enhance existing activities. We go out with public comments and meetings and things like that. And then we're told that's not sufficient. What would be helpful is if we could have a template and not an in advice form, just, just uh, come up with a memo or something like that of what the PIC thinks. Yeah, so so we, we are working on the same definition that regardless of the topic, if we have a template that says these these number of days out, it, you do X. Uh, this number of days out from the event, you do X. You have this event, and this is this is what it should look like. You have follow up X number of days out. You know, some kind of template because I think that as we try to do something and are told, no, that's not sufficient, uh, a, 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 uh, a clear definition of what uh, is expected would help, if that makes sense. That's fair, Gary. It's, and sorry, I had to turn off my video because my internet's acting up. Um, I can appreciate if you're feeling frustrated trying to hit the target um, and we can do what we can to to clarify that I guess my response again would be we we as a board talked two years ago about having a committee of the whole on end states and we had a lot of ideas about where that could go and I guess we need to keep working as an issue management team to to help clarify how to make that a successful conversation uh, but I think that um, I'm trying to get back to what our actual advice point was um, workshops and visioning process on cleanup end states could discuss the final disposition of the tank waste, buildings, reactors, and legacy contaminated soils. Um, yeah, maybe the, the HAB end state discussion can provide you the guidance for how to have it on a broader scale um, once we get there. It's a big topic. It's hard to get our arms around. Sorry if I rambled there a bit. Ellie. Thanks. Everybody, thanks. I guess I have a couple comments, Gary, that or thoughts that you triggered. And one is that um, not everyone is unhappy with the public involvement that goes on. And I think uh, that a, a cautionary note is don't lump everyone together. Uh, what comes from the board is a board statement uh, should be considered by the tri-party agencies. But to to re react 
uh, against us or critically of us when organizations that are part of the board have different comments that are made. Uh, I guess I'm I'm offering a cautionary note on that. I, uh, I I'd like to see us stay very straight and true uh, with DOE responses, tri-party agency responses directly to what the board has to offer as a product and not a sweeping uh, condemnation of, you know, everyone saying uh, we're not getting what we need and you're saying we're not getting what we need. I think we need to be very clear. And um, so I'd like to see us, if we're going to entertain uh, redesigning or designing something with some specificity in terms of a public involvement event, that that happens within the committee and, uh, and gets talked about as an agenda item so that everyone is very clear that in the end, what we have to offer is a, a ends up being a, a committee product, hopefully not always a board product. I think that a lot of times the discussions that happen within committee are every bit as valuable, if not more so than some of the advice that we put on paper. Uh, as we think with the agencies, I think about in the past, and, and we start to uh, define and look at, you know, what it is we want to share with the public in a, in a, in a public participation participation event. So um, I'd like to see that brought back into committee where we could, uh, and Liz has certainly uh, did yeoman's work and, and Jeff is now as chair, uh, but in the past Liz has done yeoman's work and, and the committee under her uh, leadership uh, in working on different ways of designing uh, uh, public participation events that uh, that help uh, facilitate getting information at that time uh, uh, out to the public. I think that there's another thing that 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 could happen, and and, and a construct, and I, and that's that before we have public involvement uh, uh, campaigns, we, the agencies put together public presentations. You know, two weeks, three weeks in advance, maybe two weeks is enough. Uh, where people can can have tutorials and and get information on what it is you're going to be asking for when weighing in on uh, a public comment period time, so that it helps give you all three agencies a much more constructive uh, uh, um, comment or comments uh, from the public, and I think that that's something that you know. Um, as a tool uh, would be a good idea. So, but let's see if we can't, you know, get our conversations into committee and deal with uh, the discussions uh, directly from our committees and our board. Thanks. Tom, Cecilia, do you want to jump in? Or Jerry? I'm reacting to things in the chat. No, I was just going to say it sounds like a good idea for a pick white paper on how to have an act, uh, effective public engagement campaign. I guess I would say that that's not a bad idea, but uh, since our public evolve, involvement events are so situational, it seems like it would be better to look at them, you know, look at them individually and not try to have something that is, we then, you know, becomes a, uh, uh, an umbrella fit and, and not quite right for, for uh, every single uh, public uh, event. I don't know if there's an analogy here, but I'm going to put Gary on the spot. So when we're working on HAB committee meetings or HAB board meetings, there's a lag time for presentations that's pretty, pretty long in terms of getting draft presentations through the review process at Department of Energy. So our, our timeline for planning is, is really kind of long. The question to the TPA agencies is, is the planning 
time needed for public comment periods or public meetings as as long and potentially onerous as it is what we do for have meetings. I don't have an answer for that from the DOE perspective because I don't work with the public comment team. I will work to get a response on that. I just know that that from the HAB perspective, we're looking at three weeks minimum to get something through headquarters, and then I need a couple of weeks before that to work it through the local uh, uh, management. So I'm looking at uh, five to six weeks of working time from the time that we conceptualize a uh, a presentation to delivery. So it, it, there is a significant amount of time and I will get the in, information for uh, how much time we need for for permit uh, meetings, things like that, and, unless Ecology can step in and, and bail me out on that. Hopefully, Ryan, thank you. Yeah, uh, I can't speak for DOE obviously, but from Ecology standpoint, uh, I think we've said this before, but um, you know, here at Ecology, we can usually turn around presentations a little faster than DOE can because our, our whole chain of command thing, we don't got to go up to DC or something like that. Um, so we, we're able to usually run it through our office, through our you know appropriate subject matter experts for a presentation uh, relatively quicker. I think we I think the timing really depends on their workload um, of the of the person that would be making the presentation. Uh, but the approval process is much, much, much shorter. We usually just would run that by, you know, David or Stephanie or something like that, just for a final look through at a presentation. Um, but usually we're we're able to turn our presentations around pretty fast. Uh, same as have meetings. Um, I wouldn't say there's much of a difference in timing between our have presentations versus our, you know, public meeting presentations. Hey, Gary and Ryan, this is Jen Colborn. Um, so at minimum, I would say four to six weeks to begin a presentation to get it through approval. Um, I just sent one up to headquarters today for the January 11th public meeting. I was ahead of the game on that one, but given the holidays and people being um, out on vacation, that also played a factor. Headquarters needs at least a two week turnaround time on their review. So um, hopefully that's helpful, but it, it does, like Ryan indicated, ecology they're a little bit quicker on their review process here at DOE. It does take a significant amount of time and effort to get those um, approved and then up to headquarters. Thank you, Jen. I was in the process of sending you an email, so I'm glad you popped in. You're welcome. R Roberto, do you have a, a general sense about your, your EPA logistics? Yeah, I'd, uh, yeah. Um... So regarding the public comment uh, process, uh, personally, I haven't had too much experience with that. Um, I'm still relatively new, uh, but I do. Uh, uh, EPA does have a similar uh, situation as Ecologies, where we don't have to go too far up uh, to change command. Uh, also, that's also depending on the the subject at hand. Uh, so that's one thing to to consider. Uh, but the other thing that's uh, really uh, a determining factor uh, for the logistics is uh, our bandwidth. And currently, EPA only has uh, Emmy Laiha and I. Um, well, Emmy Laiha, she's an alternative. She's a backup, but she's currently involved with other things, and she's going to be on detail soon. So it's only myself uh, taking on that responsibility uh, when it comes to the HAB and the presentations. Um, if there's anyone else that, if there's a particular uh, project manager or subject matter subject matter expert, um, then I have to take into, I also have to take into, into consideration their workload on top of my workload. That's outside, but that's outside of the hab. So, you know, four to six weeks, and also <laughs> depending on the holidays and um, the the workload. Gary, thank you for waiting. I wanted to make sure we checked in with all three agencies. Gary Puller. Um, I'll just put my hand down. Sorry. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, 
Um, Tom Galeotto asked what the January 11th meeting was, and that was from um, this morning's talk on the TPA, TPA public involvement calendar. It's the 400 area WMU class two permit modification. There you go. Link in the in the chat with more more information from the events calendar. So we've got about 10 minutes left uh, before we take a break and then go into open forum where we can talk more broadly about things. There was a, a second half of this topic that I just wonder if anyone has thoughts or or just an impetus around. Um, and that was the idea of, of um, trying to figure out both among ourselves and soliciting from the public, how do we want to be involved in the foundational topics and decisions that are happening right now, that have been happening throughout the COVID period. Uh, in my mind, I see it connected to this idea of kind of a spring welcome back to Hanford type meeting. Here's what you missed. Here are the big things that are happening right now. That part of that could be, let's talk about what all the big things are right now, just because sometimes it's hard to keep track of what they all are. And then let's educate everybody on how public involvement works for each one of these. Something like the central plateau principles and parameters, you know, it would have been good to know a year ago. Well, it's something that gets worked out by the agencies. Your opportunity for comment happens at this time as part of this process, um, that kind of thing. And you could look at other issues like tank waste and the holistic negotiations. Here's where the public is planned to be involved in this large foundational thing that we're deciding. Um, and here's what that process is going to look like. Um, those kinds of questions, I think. So I just seeing if anybody else has thoughts along this line as well. Um, am I kind of off in left field here thinking that there's there's some ability here to marry up this desire to be involved in foundational decisions with what seems to be true that there are some foundational things being worked out right now to then turn that into a public education and outreach opportunity. Jacob. Jacob? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. there you are. Yeah. Great. So, so uh, you know, uh, in in the tank waste committee and to a lesser extent, some other places, people have expressed disappointment that we're sort of left out in the dark on this these uh, uh, holistic negotiations, which feel like policy priorities um, from the outside, based on all of the things they tell us they can't discuss because they're in the holistic negotiation. And here is a group that's supposed to give advice on policies, and we're sort of told you can't play. And I, I think that's frustrating to a lot of people. Um, and I, I don't know that we would get broad consensus on the have on all of those policies, but but being sort of left in the dark on the discussion, it's frustrating to me. Um, and I can I can tell it's frustrating to other people. My question is, do we need a, uh, a, a working group to discuss that? Is there any advice we think that might could come out of that? Like maybe they could tell us what they're discussing and for instance. Um, that, that might come out of that. That's one of my questions. And I don't know if that, the tank waste, I brought this up with the tank waste committee. They didn't sound like they were ready as the tank waste committee to do that. The pick seems like the next one. Now I'm not a member of the pick. I just happen to have the pick in the background while I'm doing my work. Um, but uh, I just thought that's something that, you know, maybe the, the pick committee should consider.
Is this the time when we say everyone is a member of the PIC? <laughs> it, it, it's an opt in. So if you want to be, the answer is yes. But we don't put every member of the HAB automatically on the PIC. Jacob, what you said is not falling on deaf ears, even though we're not all jumping to respond. Um, I, I would agree that, you know, I've heard and experienced myself some eagerness to understand how we are going to be involved in the holistic negotiations um, and where, where our opportunity comes in. Uh, looks like we've got some people wanting to jump in. Yeah, Steve and then Shelly. Yeah, just a thought on Jacob's comment is I think we all share that same frustration. The, the, um, I guess my thought would be I don't want to waste our time generating advice on something that the answer will be that it's a legal issue that you can't be involved in. We already told you that. I, I don't know that we could have any advice or comment that would make a difference at this point. I don't know that it would make a difference, but I don't know that it. I don't think it would make a difference. So, so Steve, if I can jump in, I I would. I'm skeptical that they can't. That it's a legal thing that they can't tell us about. I really am. Um, you know, I would like to see what. What aspect of this is making it illegal for them to, to tell us about it? I mean, that's what I'm curious. I can't disagree with you. It's just the response I've always gotten is because we told you so. And that, that dates back a long time. Prior to the holistic. I've got Shelly and Jerry. Shelly? Thanks, Ruth. Hey, everybody. Um, I guess, Jacob, in response to your idea, uh, I was a member of the Tank Waste Task Force that helped negotiate the single shell tanks into the legal, you know, legally binding milestones. And we, of course, we had uh, negotiators from each of the tri parties involved. And uh, um, it, you know, this was just this was the precursor to building the Hanford Advisory Board and designing it. And uh, it was the summer before. And uh, the construct and the way the way it was constructed, and uh, in order to go through those negotiations over the sum, summer, uh, was very specific uh, with confidentiality forms that were signed by all of us that represented the public. I believe Jerry was a participant in that process also. And um, um, and it was very successful. You know, they went behind closed doors and they, they hammered things out. And when they got stuck, they came to us and said, what do you think? And we lobbed as many ideas as we could and saw what stuck. And, and they took all of that and went back behind closed doors and negotiated some more came back and said, we're stuck. What do we do now? And and that was the iteration that we went through. And it worked. Um, we're, it's a different time. Certainly the, the demands of, of the numbers of people who want to be participant, participants and stakeholders in this uh, is considerably larger. But it doesn't mean that it couldn't happen. Uh, but I think it would be very dependent on the regulatory agencies and DOE, ORP, and RL uh, uh, wanting that and and looking for that as a uh, some kind of construct for, you know through which they could do negotiations. Um, I don't think that's something that we could. Uh, initiate other than say, you know, you might go back and look at the tank waste task force and how that was constructed and uh, this, you know, the significance of the, of the uh, uh, positive outcomes that came from that. 
Um, so I, I'm, I'm not, it's not clear to me that we, I would want to spend a lot of time on this other than maybe saying, you know, maybe look for other ways so that we can be a little more open. But I understand the need to, uh, where the rubber hits the road, have negotiations that are behind closed doors. What I don't see built into this right now that was built into the tank waste task force is looking to the public for some solutions. The holistic negotiations are going on without us, uh, any of us. So uh, I don't know if that's a very you know satisfying answer, Jacob, but you know I, I don't know that in this time uh, we could see something different. I'm not sure. Thanks. Jerry. Um, I'm trying to get back in here. We can hear you. Oh, well, that's good. Okay. Um, uh, thank you, Shelley. Yes, I, I think history is very important here. Um, that in addition to the Tank Waste Task Force, um, the current holistic negotiation, whatever is in there, it appears to be parallel to the negotiations on the tank consent decree, um, which went on for several years. And for that process, ecology made a commitment and discussed its goals and had some check-ins with um, a wide range of uh, entities from Oregon to uh, different stakeholder groups. And the result was something that was much more likely to meet public and stakeholder and tribal, I should say, as well, um, uh, priorities. Uh, the choice of doing something in secret in terms of the negotiations is entirely the agencies. Um, I think we have understood historically that USDOE never wants to talk about anything that's in negotiations in public. That's its choice. It's not a legal requirement. It's simply a choice that it makes. Um, and that um, the regulators can make a different choice as a matter of policy. And I would urge them to do so because otherwise anything that comes out of the agreements is likely to be subject to the proverbial circular firing squad. And at this point in time, um, I don't think that the public and policymakers um, even un understand because what the state's goals are for those negotiations. It has never articulated goals in public. And that this doesn't mean that you share specific negotiations or details, uh, but you have a commitment to getting input and trying to test the water about what you're proposing and the result will always be better. Yeah, I don't have any more people in queue. Liz has joined us. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, I was uh, just looking back at the letters that Oregon wrote back in 2018. We sent a letter to Ecology and DOE when they were negotiating milestones after System Plan 8 uh, to recommend that they take a pause in the middle of their negotiations and consult the public and the Hanford Advisory Board on areas of potential agreement and disagreement. We referenced the Tankways Task Force. Um, I, I I knew that we'd done it at some point, but I I couldn't remember if it, if I dreamed that we'd actually said this out publicly or if we'd done it as a board. Um, but we did uh, 
sent a letter once upon a time. Anyway. We are uh, overdue for a break. If we want to continue this conversation about expectations for for involvement in some of the big stuff that's going on right now, um, let's save that for after. But uh, yeah, let's let's take a little break. Shall we check in with Shelley before we do that? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Shelley. Thank you. Just uh, you know, a thought. In the spring, uh, the site starts system plan 10. So add that to uh, things to consider, please, uh, uh, in terms of your workload. I believe it's, I think it's, I think it comes up this spring. It starts this spring. So. And for those who are new, the system plans are a model of how the tank waste treatment mission goes. Everything from how to get waste out of tanks to how to get it across the site to the rate of how fast you can turn it into glass. Or it's kind of like a big model train engine. Uh, and they can use this model to then ask questions of it, kind of like one of those crystal balls, you know, magic eight ball, to say, what if we tweak the system in this way? Um, and it's part of their continual improvement process, looking for new ways to to envision the tank waste treatment design and process and all of that. Um, it's been fodder for many uh, discoveries about the tank waste mission, um, oftentimes that it's going to be harder than we thought and, and take more time and, and all of that. But we also learn a lot of interesting things about the system every time it, it comes forward. Um, okay, uh, let's take a break and we'll come back together. Uh, what do you think, Ruth? What time? Uh, 2.20, 2.25, pick one. Let's say 2.20. Okay. All right, thank you. If folks are back, uh, we're going to be getting into the open forum here, but before we do, I want to take chair's prerogative here to um, review something that Roberto put in the chat um, and change my tune a little bit on the response that we got to our advice. Uh, I think what he sent was the meeting minutes from the interagency management team uh, and their meeting from September of this year where they talked specifically about the TPA five-year review. So, you know, separate from the circular five-year review. And this page here, the blue table uh, describes, I think it describes the scope of that uh, TPA five-year review. And you can see here, number five, specifically mentions that the principles and parameters document is subject to review during this TPA five-year review. Um, and as we heard and saw in the comments, there is a public comment planned for this review process. And so if we get some kind of public outreach component to the TPA public process, and if that can, can help us understand these five items and that gives people a good basis to then be able to comment. I think that we do, maybe not in the order that we would have asked for, but I think we do get that public opportunity on a foundational document that we asked for. Um, and for that, I, I have to say that's a good response. Um, so thanks. And uh, yeah. Just wanted to bring that up before we get into the rest of our open forum topics. And uh, I have some high hopes for what that can be. So thanks. And now we are entering into our open forum, which for anybody on the pick, on the hab, uh, if you would like to bring up any topics related to public involvement, if you'd like to revisit any of the topics that we've talked about so far today, 
um, this is our time. There are also some prompts in the agenda uh, if there are things that we want to talk about, um, such as what would make it easier for me to engage as a new or returning HAB member? Um, it, kind of an extension of the morning, but more specifically on how can we make the stuff that we're doing right here, right now, um, a little bit easier. And another topic potentially we could be talking about here in the open forum is what an optimal meeting design post COVID might be, uh, talking about virtual hybrid meetings. So that's that's my kickoff to the next 45 minutes to an hour that we have. I'd like to open it up. Would anybody like to jump in? I'm really curious as to the answers to your second question. <laughs> that's that's something that's keeping me up at night. So. Well, if we don't get any other folks coming in with other topics, um, we can brainstorm that. I have Roberto and Tom Cecilia. Roberto. Oh, uh, well, I guess if we're going with the having uh, pick members first, and I guess Tom should go first. No? Oh, all right. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to respect the process. Um, yeah, so I remember uh, a few, uh, not a few years ago, a few weeks ago, if uh, not a few months ago, uh, we had a conversation about environmental justice and how to introduce that uh, with uh, public involvement and uh, the pick and have it hampered as a whole. Um, I, I do have a, a meeting next week with one of uh, EPA's uh, environmental justice uh, staff uh, people, and uh, with that, uh, meeting, I would like to be able to gather. Uh, sorry, with this meeting, I'd like to be able to gather some information that I can help um, relay for next week, so that I'm able to procure more material, more information that would be relevant and useful uh, to this uh, conversation. Or to, uh, sorry, to the to the pick. And I know I've already reached out to Jeff, and he has provided me some material. Uh, I'm not sure if I gave you a response uh, on that email, um, Jeff. Uh, I think you did. Uh, yeah. Well, okay. Good. Um, but yeah, if there's anything else on top of that that would be very useful, uh, or that you think would be very useful, um, yeah, feel free to reach out to me, uh, well, either you know, here or in a separate email, uh, whatever you're comfortable with. Steve Anderson, are you on this topic or uh, a different one? Oh, no, this one. Should I be on a different one? I could be on a different one, too. No, no, no. I just didn't want to, to chop up the, the discussion by bouncing back and forth. So if you're on this one, why don't you go and I will grovel a bit for Tom and Ryan. No, no worries. I didn't want to circumvent Tom's participation either he was okay so i guess um um you know in relation to yeah, how do we engage and do some other things one of the things that i was um that i really appreciate is when topics come up and we distribute them and the way everybody goes through their email if there is um uh links to the supporting documentation that i think most of us want to be able to drill down to become um uh, better informed about the topic you know i understand that yeah there's hanford.gov and there's about 37 different channels of ways to get lost in there um, but it's really related to the specific conversation point that we're trying to discuss or bring up and if there are those reference documents because i i love when there is that reference material and i love it even more when it's from two different perspectives not just one um, and and then you can kind of go through that and you feel like you're informed but your time is um is kind of uh respected as, as if that makes any sense so that um uh we're, we're not having to 
to send people out uh, investigating and looking for what I think um, are the other supporting elements of it. And and it sounds like uh, you know the more and more things come up, it's always uh, relevant when when somebody says, "Yeah, you can find this here." Oh, I didn't know that was there. Oh, you know, so all of those things become exposed, and I think that's uh, that's good stuff. Steve, do you have an example or two of the kinds of um, in, in terms of some of the things that we're doing, um, I, I guess I'm just thinking about we try to put together a weekly summary by log for the, uh, the Tri-City Local Business Association, which I still kind of am a part of. And, and uh, one of the things that we've tried to emphasize is making sure that there are linked documents within the context of the conversation so that people got as much of that relevant information as possible in one quick swipe. And a lot of times with some of the updated posting things, um, it's it's great that it's right there in, in front of you. You know you should probably go deeper into investigating other alternative uh, views on certain topics. And this one specific is in relation to um, just small modular reactors. And so there's a, a variety of different elements in the, the conversation. And so it's got uh, not only those uh, pros, but it's got uh, opposing elements and, you know, some conversation from, um, you know, Greenpeace experts as well as, you know, some of the Hanford advisory folks. And uh, I, I just think that that's a really good way of getting people up to speed, plus engaging them in, in how they can uh, feel their knowledge base has increased and and give every viewpoint uh, an opportunity to be understood. Because if, if we don't understand, I think the opposing elements were missing the picture. So uh, if I hold a certain belief about something, I feel like most of my time should be trying to understand why somebody feels differently about it than I do, um, is the only way that I can defend my position. Um, so uh, that's just that's my two cents, Jeff. Thanks. OK. So Tom Cecilia, were you on Roberto's topic or a different one? I think I was on the second prompt. OK, so I'm going to check in with Emmett. Emmett, are you on Roberto's topic or a different one? Uh, Roberto's topic. OK, so why don't you go so we sort of keep the conversation packaged? Yes. So, you know, there's been a lot of discussions about what is environmental justice. And so I was just wondering, what is our perspective of environmental ju justice? You know, it, it's how big is it? How small is it? What is it to us? That was my first question. I'll come back with another one later. Thank you. Uh, did, do you want to respond to this right now, or or that's just just a rhetorical? <laughs> I think he's looking for a response, Roberto. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> had, I could just say we've had it. We've had it. There's been previous discussions mentioned in the pick about it, and so I, I'm just and I don't know if we really have really narrowed it down and say this is what it means to us. And maybe I missed it. I don't know. But it'd be nice to know what it means to you, your organization. Yeah, so for EPA, uh, environmental justice, um, well, I guess to narrow it down to the scope of Hanford. Um, so environmental justice is uh, considering that, uh, that all the remedial action is uh, done uh, equitably and um, in consideration with uh, uh, communities of uh, a color of, of ethnic minorities and uh, low-income populations, just to start off with. But there wasn't, a, there has not been a defined um, community with environmental justice concerns within uh, Hanford or within the scope of, <clears throat> sorry, within the scope of Hanford. And that was uh, that 
definition or that determination is not set in stone. It's not something that uh, cannot be changed. And when I gave that presentation back in, I think it was like late September, uh, that was uh, to start the conversation or rather continue the conversation of how is that defined in Hanford? And from there, that's where uh, I reached out to Jeff, for example, uh, to get more information on how, how, how would environmental justice be defined here? Uh, what, what applies to Hanford and what doesn't apply to Hanford? Because it's not just uh, you know, a simple black and white uh, issue. It's, it, it can be very nuanced. And to stay on this topic for, yeah, Roberto did reach out to me over right before Thanksgiving to let me know this topic was coming. Um, and, and I think you're right that we as a PIC and we as a board have not really defined what environmental justice means to us. We started that conversation. Um, we started thinking about what kind of future meeting designs we wanted to have to help us come up with those kinds of conversations. We're not there yet. Um, what I offered to Roberto was discussion of environmental justice from the perspective of who are we protecting, as well as the conversations I've heard of environmental justice in regards to where are the opportunities and the benefits of cleanup going, um, because it is you know where a lot of resources are dedicated. There are job opportunities, those kinds of things um, that there. To me, there are some some multiple dimensions there. I think there's also just um, still trying to understand where and how the exposure scenarios fit in, uh, and that relates to the environmental justice of protection. Of who are you trying to protect by the action you're taking? Um, and also some discussion of drinking water standards because that's been talked about in the national academies. So that that's what I offered, uh, but I do encourage. You know, the invitation was there. If you have thoughts you wanted to bring in, it's a good opportunity. Yeah, and, and also just really quick, um, another reason why I'm asking this is because uh, I myself am not a Hanford uh, local. Uh, I went to visit for the first time about a month ago, and that's been my only exposure to Hanford. So the, the culture, the, the people, the uh, demographics, I have not fully experienced that. So it, it serves. Uh, so, so yeah, me asking uh, about environmental justice and how that, uh, what that means to uh, the group as a whole or individually would be really helpful in order for me to be able to provide something that would be uh, productive. Who else wants to help Roberto? Uh, this is Dan Solitz. Uh, I've got some thoughts that, that may not real, be really close to environmental justice as we normally think about it, but there's a question of inter-regional equity and who bears the burden of the legacy waste and how should that be equitably distributed. And uh, Hanford pr probably should get a credit for what it's taking on now, what we'll continue to take on to the future and should be able to use that credit someplace else to put waste where we can't, um, we're not, geolo we're not geologically capable of, of handling it. And then there's the question of intergenerational equity in that what uh, the people who get the benefits pass on the cost, but they also should figure out a way to pass on the benefits to future generations. So I think that environmental justice is, is bound up with, with uh, time and, and space. I, Liz, I don't remember the IM team being formed. Somebody help me with my memory. Josh, do you remember that in the minutes? We talked about I, doing it in the minutes, but I don't think it actually happened. Totally having a blonde moment. 
going to say that the idea was brought up, but I'm not sure anyone other than Liz or Jeff actually volunteered for it. <laughs> Looks like I set up a Teams for it with just those two at the moment. Okay, so yes, but small. So if anyone wants to join, it sounds like Josh got us started on Teams. Thanks for doing it. Jerry, are you on the EJ topic? Yes. Okay, why don't you go, and I'm not going to forget Tom and Ryan. I just want to make sure we keep it fun. Okay. You know, one of the most fundamental aspects of environmental justice in terms of Hanford cleanup is understanding and respecting and incorporating the potential increased exposure and harm to both health and culture of the tribal nations whose ceded lands and treaty rights to live along and fish the river and use inland resources are affected by these decisions. And um, we do not have solid grounding in the board on what those rights are and discussion and learning about them. Uh, and I do believe firmly, and I've discussed this with some of the uh, tribes and um, want to begin raising this, that every board meeting should begin with a land acknowledgement as a way of beginning that journey of understanding. And um, in this era, it is very meaningful to have land acknowledgements and it says a lot if you don't have a land acknowledgement when you are making decisions that are explicitly about the exposure and traditional cultural properties of the nations who still have tri tribal treaty rights um, that we're making decisions about. So I want to put that out again that um, I think we should be having a conversation about having um, a land acknowledgement at the beginning of each advisory board meeting and I can't see the participant list. I don't know if Dana is on or who else is on from any of our tribal nations right now um, if they want to offer some feedback. But that's I think a very important aspect of what we need to be doing to just begin to understand and show some recognition of our understanding. Um, and it is literally the tip of the iceberg only. Um, the real rubber hits the road when you say, we will not stand, sit by idly when we say that we're making a cleanup decision and not using a tribal exposure scenario for people who will be exercising treaty rights and have greater exposure which is literally unconscionable and as someone who is a dear mentor of mine russell jim said that's what we call genocide i'd like to hear feedback about the idea of having a land ex acknowledgement at the beginning of meetings and especially if we have any of our tribal representatives on right now. I don't see any on the list. I'm going to double check for you, Jerry, but I think Dana had to ring off. I, I can say that I attend a number of meetings that do, that do an acknowledgement at the beginning of every meeting and and I think it's um, I think it's a worthy activity. Other thoughts? Sure, this is Shelley. I think we'd have to get there as a board. 
And and that would I think that we'd need some discussions and probably some educationals from the tribes, from other interested entities and uh, and and uh, explore that and talk about it so that we better understand what that means and uh, and what we're all uh, acknowledging is important. So I don't think it's a bad idea at all, uh, but I think uh, it needs to be done collaboratively and with consensus. Are we ready to move on to those who have been waiting in queue? Meaning we're changing the subject. And I don't want to cut this off if if folks still need to jump in. Tom Cecilia, you've been waiting. Yeah, um, I, I'll jump on to the end of the last topic first because I like the idea of land acknowledgement. Um, it's tricky on a virtual meeting to figure out um, who's acknowledging which land because you know we're in multiple states, multiple time zones. Um, and is it the facilitator? Is it the host? Is it the chair? You know, worth worth discussing for sure. Um, when we're in person, it's a no brainer. Um, and what I wanted to talk about was um, the optimal meeting design post COVID. Um, which is the second prompt. Um, I think that it has to be hybrid. Um, just the nature of the thing. Um, and I mentioned earlier that um, it's going to have to be, it has a longer lead up than they ha have meetings traditionally have in the past. It's going to take a lot of location scouting to find some somewhere big enough with good enough internet to handle what we need. Um, and if you know DOE is going back in person over three waves starting at the end of February at the soonest, you know, we could, you know, you know on a stretch goal be looking at March. So uh, you know, whatever ground troops need to go out to find a location, you know, we can always cancel a spot, but we can't find one last minute. I will be in Richland for at least a week in January. I'm still figuring that out, but um, Josh doesn't know yet, but we're going on field trip. How about uh, high school cafeterias with large projector screens? So you can do the Brady Bunch window off to the side, has internet, and it's a big space. Or Wazoo. Well, that'd be up in. Oh, you mean the the local campus, not the yeah, Tri Cities? Tri Cities Wazoo. There's some conference or uh, auditorium classrooms, I think, there. That I think there's one at CBC as well. And we could get some young people to the meetings to, you know, learn about Hanford. I need to take a look at the revamp Hanford house. I haven't seen the remodel yet. I think it's now a holiday inn. I'm dating myself. What other aspects other than the, the physical venue aspects in terms of internet, um, phone, physical space? Um, what are the other criteria or components that would help make a hybrid meeting work for you? Thinking about those of you who may be able to come in person and those of you who actually are probably stuck in the virtual world for longer. Susan baking for all of us. Yeah. 
Hey, we got criteria and we know what they are. This website does not accept cookies. <laughs> it would very good. <laughs> but I do. I struggle thinking through what if I'm stuck here in Oregon, and I hope not to be, and there are people meeting in a large room somewhere else, am I going to miss out on seeing everyone's face? And it almost seems like you need to still have a computer in front of everybody just so I can still see your face if I'm not there or whoever is not able to be there. And so you, it adds to your technology burden potentially uh, to have something like that. And I know there are different people have been working on this for a while. And I think Microsoft is trying to come out with some specific hardware and software solutions. There's this thing that looks like an owl that sits in the center of a table and turns its head and looks at whoever is talking. Um, that might be a way to try to cut down on some of the technology needs. Um, you know, this board, we've saved a lot of money on travel. And so if we can invest some of that in whatever technology we need to make hybrid meetings, work um, be nice i foresee lunch with River, riverside dave um when people say that i worry about is there a potential to make it more difficult for folks who may not have a laptop that they can just bring with them and stick in front of them i agree yeah um, I, I worry about that even though i don't know who those individuals are yeah, often smartphones can do the same thing. If you have a good stand that you can just put in front of you, you are asking people to dedicate their devices to that potentially, and that would be a voluntary thing. Um, and plugins, because if meetings are in fact long, not everybody's battery will last. Sure. But well, you not... know, we've been we've been kind of inventing this over the last couple of years, but we shouldn't forget that we always had a call in option for the have meetings and it was a little bit more trouble, but we weren't really dealing with faces. We were just li li listening or people were listening in and making comments that is appropriate. I think that we could do a little bit better than that with the kind of technology that's being developed but in the end if there is an option to come in person then you know maybe most everyone would try to come but maybe it's not possible for people who are living great distances or maybe there are in you know internal office policies that you know uh, dictate who can come to the meeting and who can't but um when we get to the place where we can travel, these things will begin to resolve, I think. Yeah. Jan, that's a good reminder that we did find a way to do this before COVID. And, and yes, we didn't have video yet, but it, it worked. I think the innovation is the cue because it was always hard to tell when people who were on the phone wanted to participate. And now that you can do teams from home maybe you don't see everyone's face but you can still at least use the chat to get in the queue and that's good and i i have to say that we really do have a kind of a culture in this meeting not to turn on our cameras where i have been attending meetings that you know are called webinars and there are 60 or 100 people you can't see everyone on one screen you know you have to kind of page through if you're looking for a person but generally speaking very few people show their faces mm. i think that we would have better meetings in person partly because of that yeah. jerry brings up a good point building on tom's point about social distancing where if we do come back in person and we're in a bigger space that's more cavernous we're gonna have a harder time hearing each other and virtual people are gonna have a really hard time if every single person doesn't have their own microphone in front of them. But our computers do have mics. Certainly. Mm, some do, some don't. And we'd more than likely be masked too in, um, oh, right. in a space. So um, <laughs> add that to muffled voices. <laughs> We have to get those clear face masks, right? 
Those are awful. I, I think the point of what I was raising here is I literally just, um, uh, you know, had um, 40 students and presenters in a classroom and probably 10 guest experts outside uh, external on Zoom, and we were able to show everyone who's in the classroom, uh, large classroom spread out, uh, and pick up sound and have everyone participate. Um, and yes, everyone was wearing a mask um, and everyone was vaccinated. Um, and um, it works, you know, pretty well, and I wouldn't be surprised if WSU Tri-Cities has the setup to do that because mm -hmm. that's how institutions that are doing hybrid learning are uh, had to move to have that available in classrooms. Um, and you, if you want to do it with everyone having a laptop in front of them, you can do that and still pick up the presentation from the screen because you're linked in to the screen with your online platform. Um, but you then just need to tell people you must only um, unmute yourself when called on. That's the only caveat, which is not any different than when we have meet in person with microphones. Let me let me ask a question about pace as participants in a meeting. I worry a lot about how fast or how slow we go and because I'm a time nerd, right? Um, and online meetings just go slower. It's, it's just the way they are. If the facilitator is is needing to track because it's relatively easy with my three computers here to keep track of the participants, the presentation, and the chat, relatively speaking, ignoring the text and the email. If a facilitator is also reading an in-person room plus the chat plus those other things, it it will go a little slower. Um, how's that gonna affect your experience as a meeting participant when there's a lag of looking at hands in the room or cards or however people are waving to say, you know, I want to jump into the conversation and the chat and melding those two. I mean, at what point does the pace begin to drive you nuts? I think oh, I think I, I think that we should not be trying to uh, have a virtual meeting that relies a lot about people with a uh, relies a lot with people talking uh you know and i'm only going by those things that i have done where everyone is muted when they come in and so that provides for uninterrupted presentations so i think that the emphasis should be on the presentations if that's the way we're going to do it rather than um, a kind of free form discussion, which I think is a lot harder to control. And of course, we all know about breakout rooms, which I don't think would be appropriate for this venue. But, you know, we could talk about that, too, where you had smaller groups who wanted to talk about certain things. But um, generally speaking, I think that uh, uh, what would happen is that you would have, you know, a leader and you would have speakers and that would be how it would be controlled. Not everyone talks. I've got folks in queue. I've got Liz, Tom, and Shelley. Liz? Yeah, I, I guess I have a few thoughts. Um, one is I think you'd know in advance, you could poll people to see who's going to be virtual and who's going to be in person. So you wouldn't be blindly showing up and having half the people and, ah, what do we do? Um, and it may just be a platform change. I don't know how locked in we are to Teams, but when we use GoToMeeting, because I I tuned in I turned in tuned in by phone to 
I mean, so many meetings that I couldn't get to in person. And there were usually, you know, the majority of people would be in the room and, it, and the uh, burden was on, it might not be fair, but it, it seemed to work. The burden was on the people who were showing up virtually to speak up and get the attention of um, the people in the room if they wanted to participate. Um, because the flow of the in-person dynamics just more important because you're reading the room, you're looking at people. When you know people, it's easier. So knowing voice, like voice recognition, I didn't need to see anyone I knew who was talking unless I didn't. And then I'd say, who is that? Mm -hmm. And I could be texting someone I know in the room. You know, there's just other tools. Um, obviously that's harder if you don't know everyone and are new, but I, I don't know that it would be a burden that could not be overcome. Um, I would say what's harder is if you have 30 people virtual and five in person, that's going to be a mess. Um, more than 30 in the room and 10 online. But I think you'd know ahead of time and could kind of plan around it. Thank you. Tom. Um, two things. I, I think if even if the meeting was going slower, you'd make up for it in hallway conversations um, and it would be worth it. Um, I think if you were using Teams and um, you have one computer for the presenter and then one computer that just has the chat popped out so it flashes when it, when someone enters the queue and you could glance down, um, mm -hmm. it wouldn't be as in labor intensive as now where you have to watch people's faces and the presenter and you know, it, you're going to it's more natural to be able to do that in person and just have something catch your eye um, if you just have the chat popped out instead of focusing all your attention on three screens. And and it may it may mean re looking at how we staff actual meeting days. Mm -hmm. And and Gary and I have talked about, you know, what what would that look like? But I love the fact that you guys have ideas. This is great. Um, Shelly. Well, I really like Jan's idea. I think the, the you know, the idea is designing me, the meeting to and then setting up the equipment to fit the need. Uh, that's what it sounds like you need to do. If this, then that, you know, and uh, and if we can identify uh, what technology we need in order to get through a meeting, depending on the design of the meeting. If we've got, you know, subject matter experts coming and then they're making presentations, we're all listening. That makes it pretty easy. Uh, certainly adding a round robin to that wouldn't be hard. That would uh, that would be you know that would be an easy thing. So I think we need to look at the construct of the meeting, and uh, and what the goal is of that meeting, and uh, and design accordingly. So it's really good right now to sort of kick around these ideas. I'm not a technology expert by any stretch, but but to think about what kinds of meetings we could have, and then what technologies are available to meet that need. Uh, when I teach this help you. Yeah. Yeah. Pardon? I was going to say, when I teach facilitation, I really tell people you only do three things in a meeting. <laughs> you're sharing information. You're analyzing, making sense of information. What does it mean? What are the implications? And you make decisions. Those are really the only three things you do. And so when you're designing the meeting, if you know which of those three things you're doing, or if you happen to be doing them in sequence, then you can design how to get there. Right. And we'll get used to it. We've certainly gotten used to this. And, uh, you know, we let the dogs out and we pet the cats and, you know, we, we, uh, we're getting through it. I'm so looking forward to seeing everyone in person again. Um, I think there'll be a mad crush to get to the meeting. We may need a coliseum. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, Jeff, all right, do a presentation in a high school stadium at one point. Um, yeah, Ginger. Did indeed. Well, and I, I think, you know, we haven't made any attempts to use any of the other tools. So something like, um, you know, the Jamboard or the things where people can interact. If we were doing a prompt like this, where people could be jotting stuff down, um, on a on a virtual white whiteboard or flip chart, you know that may also help the process. 
Um, um, I don't, I don't know. There's other tiers of reviews. Sorry, what is the Jamboard? I have no idea. It's it's a Google <laughs> tool, so you just we, what we do is just set it up ahead of time and share the link in the chat, and then <laughs> there's the stadium. <laughs> um, share the link in the chat, and everybody would navigate use the use the link to navigate, and then you can just put your own sticky note and your ideas. So, you know, um, if it was you know what issues do you think we should talk about for the next? Um, Committee of the whole and people just were like, you know, putting a paragraph down and then you could come back together so everybody could get their ideas on paper and then come back together and go over it and prioritize or rank them or things like that. There are a number of platforms that will let you do those nomo group processes asynchronously and then you you meld them back. Sure, that makes sense. Great ideas. Been getting back with my tech people and and our our AV guy. Um, I know Riverside Dave wants to see all of you again. <laughs> he keeps saying when when, but we haven't lost him. We haven't been able to use him yet. The last person I had in queue was Ryan Miller. Hey, Ruth, uh, you can just knock me off. It's OK. I can just knock you off. Don't tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> Knocking off a regulator could be hazardous to my health. What else? I don't know. Right now, we need to. Oh. Is there any other topic we need to wrestle with here in open? I don't want to neglect the first prompt that was put in the open forum about what could make it easier for us as individuals to engage as HAB members, especially as we have new people who have different needs, different schedules potentially. Um, you know, those of us who are returning. Or even those of you who this was your first meeting and, you know, what worked well for you and what drove you nuts? Working was not. Karaoke. Says the musician on the committee. Afraid we lost Jeff. I think we lost Jeff. Uh oh. That's because because he wasn't going to sing us a song, I guess. Ginger. Well, I, I, you know, again, there are tools that we're we're usually so cramped for time, but there may be tools that we could utilize that could add some element of playfulness or something like that. You know, like. If people introduce themselves, how's your day? What flavor, you know, if you were an ice cream, what flavor of ice cream would you be? I don't know, just things to, especially as long as we're still virtual, to help people get to know each other better with a new, with a new membership. Um, there are ways to do virtual icebreakers and just add an element of playfulness. What do people think about icebreakers? Um, I've got groups that love them. I've got groups that mm, they would kill me if I tried that. Depends on how many people are there. Well, I, mean, it's the the chat. Chat. I don't know. I mean, like I can understand what you're saying, Tom, if you're like in a big room and and you're only still going to meet a few handful of people if you're trying to do a moving around icebreaker. Um, and it's loud and weird, but like if it's something where you're just entering stuff in the chat or even like a poll anywhere where it's, you know, 
I don't know, just some weird, how many of you have cats? How many of you have dogs? I don't know. Just something that's a, a mental break that's frivolous um, and but gets people sharing. Yeah, I've done like prompts during break before, so you can sort of encourage a hallway conversation in the chat during breaks. Um, but some people don't like hearing the chat ding. Well, and I, I keep I keep the meeting running over breaks and lunch for that. I mean, I I go quiet, but you know, in the event you all want to talk about whatever. You can change the settings so it may or may not ding for you. Liz. Um, what this is, it's kind of separate and I, and I apologize. My attention's a little split with kids arriving and other things I'm dealing with. Um, so if you're like, Liz, we already talked about this, please forgive me. Um, I know, and I don't really know where this is going to land, but this idea of incorporating new board members and creating space to get to know each other. Um, I have authored and, and checked with a few new people to see if it's helpful to have uh, like an hour, an hour and a half long lunch session a week before the board meeting, just for people to chat and get to know what's coming up and ask informal questions, because it's a really hard, like knowing that we're still in the virtual space. Um, and there was interest. Um, and I also, I know we were waiting for the orientation to be scheduled. I did some informal introductions with um, the new um, person coming in for Shannon's seat, um, Jessica Ray, and with Simone just answering um, their questions about, and Denise Jones, um, about the board. And then and they were saying it would be of interest to just have some casual space, but also it seems like getting things through the full board is really hard. It's like, you send a question out and then it's like, oh, never gonna get it resolved. Versus just doing, oh no, I'm on a delay. I'm, or is it all broken up for you guys? Or can you- No, you're fine. It's, okay. it's not bad. Okay, so, sorry. You, you all should have been receiving pings probably in the last 24 hours. Um, Josh actually created a, a Microsoft Teams group for the entire board. New members, oh. becoming returning members. So there now is a chat space for all of the board members. So maybe that's the best. I mean, I just don't know if people check it. It's, it's an option right. that, that you have. So um, right. just and like we've done for committees and, and IM teams. Totally. So I don't know where the best space is because it wouldn't be hard for me to say, hey, here's a Zoom link. Or you want to come just chat about the upcoming board meeting? Anyone's welcome. And then you can actually meet people um, or do it in a time that works. Like I could, I could set up a poll to see you're new like is late evening better like what's the best time is it lunch is it early morning i'm flexible and willing to do something just to get new people engaged in a way that makes them want to stay and participate because i could see it'd be frustrating you come you don't know what's going on and then you're like why am i doing this um anyway i just i'm not sure where that fits or where it lands in terms of i'm willing to do work to make that happen but it needs to be a board decision to say great, go do that, or it's just outside the board, but then it's still communicating with people. So, and I know Ruth, all emails that go through you have to be approved. Like, I don't know if it's headquarters approval, but anyway, it's a complicated scheduling thing, but just to put it's, it out there. Yeah. It's local approval. I don't have to deal with headquarters. It seems like we need an, an IM team for a welcoming committee so we can have impromptu welcoming committee calls. I really like the idea of them. I think it's great, Liz. Uh, informal conversations, and it, it will, it will, it, it, uh, it's welcoming, and I like that. And I can propose it at the full board meeting too, and see if there's interest, or just say, 
I mean, when we're in person, I would just say, hey, we're going to meet over here. There is no like committee need. <laughs> it's like, hey, we're having dinner. Go come here. Let's all talk to each other. Or, hey, we're going to have this party. Or we just organize things. It was easy. In virtual space, it's harder because you actually have to get the message to the person. Um, that might not be paying attention to 50,000 emails they're getting from the hub. So anyway, I'll, I'll bring it up tomorrow, but thanks. Okay. Yeah. What do you think? Uh, I think that it's about time to get on to our next topic. Uh, were there any other thoughts about um, how to make it easier to engage? Let's make sure we're catching everything or if if you didn't get to talk about the thing you wanted to talk about today, you know, here's here's the last chance. And then we're going to get into start landing the plane here. You know, this is Emmett. Can I talk? Yeah. You know, one of you know one of the things that's missing from uh, from my perspective is the Native American input, and I know they're there are nations and the government to government. But, uh, you know, I remember we had a presentation from DOE this, this summer, I think it was, and, and we asked that question because they were doing outreach and they're outreaching to the Native Americans. And we asked, could we get that feedback and uh, what, they, what they had to say? But we never did receive that feedback. And I, you know, I, I've, uh, been on the Native American programs here at Hammer, and I've been. Uh, I went to school in Lewiston, so with uh, Nez Perce, a lot of, and so I just don't know if we ever receive their concerns or their issues if they mesh with our, some of ours. I just I I don't know that. I don't know. Has anyone else got a perspective on that? Well, I've found in the past, you've got to go talk to them. Um, they're not going to come to you. They're not going to read emails. You have to go physically face to face and talk to them. And then they're, they're more than willing, I think, to participate. That's just out of respect. That's just how I've been successful in the past. So how do we make that happen? I know we have representatives, I know. Does anyone ever feel like we don't get their input? Is it only me? No, you're not alone. I, I'm interested in what you're saying. I honestly can't remember what you're talking about with the agencies saying they were going to go to the tribal governments and then tell us some of the feedback. But I am very interested in that. If I don't know, Gary, you might have, you might remember that conversation we had with the representatives from DOE? Sure, Emmett, and I, I do remember that. And uh, those discussions are, are uh, not something that are made public uh, at, at the request of the tribes. Uh, if there's something specific, then I can see if I can get a response. Uh, we, we do regular consultations with the tribes, and, and in fact, uh, uh, I've been able to attend only a couple of them myself because the circle is very small. Uh, but I can take the question and uh, and see what I can uh, I can get that they're willing to share. Come on, Jerry. And this is Roberto Mijo, uh, chiming in for EPA. Um, my I have a very uh, limited understanding uh, of the process when it comes to uh, travel 
uh, discussions, but I will ask around and see uh, what is available. I see Ginger in the chat with a specific information uh, quest, I guess, or, you know, trying to understand more what usual and accustomed practices means as that's an important phrase for setting and cleanup goals. Any other final open forum topics? Thank you, Emmett, for bringing that one forward. All right. Moving on now to have member self assessments. This is usually the time where we talk about, oh, you know, I talked to my group that I'm a part of at a meeting that we had together, or, oh, I saw someone in the grocery store and we talked about Hanford for a while. I don't know how much of that you all are doing right now, uh, but if folks have any kind of um, news to report, I guess, of kind of the outreach that you're doing individually or the conversations that you're having, I'll say for my part, I've gone to a couple of uh, three-year-old's birthday parties and I've <laughs> talked to their parents about Hanford. Um, was out at a beach house with some people and talking about the challenge of how to design a landfill so that it will uh, stymie a future driller because drillers of groundwater wells are a particularly stubborn lot, I understand. Um, <laughs> and so... <laughs> You know, I always feel really boring when I get deep into these topics, but it turns out people are really interested and you get a lot of good questions um, and people are down with the details. So that's kind of fun. I'm seeing some in chat. Anyone else want to jump in with some reflections here? Somebody at the dance studio a couple of days ago said, what do you mean, Hanford's in Washington? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I'm sorry if my connection's not great. It feels like it's a little jerky. Um, can you hear me OK? Yes. Um, we we just hired someone, and you got to hear her a little bit earlier. Her name's Mia Burke. It looks like you'd say her name Maya, but it's Mia, M-I-Y-A, um, as our program manager. And um, she's been helping us with our comment writing guides and comment writing workshops. Um, I think getting turnout for events right now is just hard. We had one on Monday and had two people show up like right when we were finishing it. Um, but we did record it and post it, so maybe we'll reach more people. Um, permit modifications are just not the easiest topic to get uh, involvement on, um, but we're working to figure out how to make things more fun and engaging um, and certainly did not fulfill our promise that it would be the most fun holiday party of the season. Um, <laughs> so um, the other thing that we've been doing, and, and if you are not getting invitations, um, let me know or if you're interested in joining, is um, having some virtual forums on different Hanford topics. Um, that's kind of a continuation of the in-person event, kind of in the spirit of the, the forum for shared conversation about challenging issues at Hanford, of which we've had eight in-person three-day events. Um, and some of you have been able to participate in those, and that's been really nice space. Um, they're not recorded. It's like more open conversation style um, to talk about different things. The last topic we were trying to get to is what's your hopeful vision for cleanup? Um, and that was, you know, just because I think we get stuck in the cynical 
gloom and doom so easily. It's the name of the song that after seven sings that all the women sing. Emmett? <laughs> I think Emmett doesn't know he's not on mute. Oh, you remember. I can, I can fix that. <laughs> um, and we're also, we've been able to do some tabling. Um, one of our staff, and I can't remember if this had happened before our last meeting, if you've heard this before, um, Allison came over and tabled at the Pasco flea market and talked to a bunch of people coming by to learn about Hanford. And she said of the 50 people she talked to, only two knew about Hanford in Pasco. So there is quite a nice challenge ahead of us to get the word out about Hanford um, in the Tri-Cities and the whole state and the country. Um, and yeah. We have a lot of outreach efforts planned, but those kind of are of note. Um, and if anyone has ideas or idea, like things that would be helpful, um, educational materials that just seem like, man, it would be so great if we had this, let me know. Um, and maybe it's something we can create. Thanks. You know, I haven't really done any kind of outreach of that kind. Yeah, I'm now, um, you know, of course, I now represent uh, uh, Hanford from the League of Women Voters, and I'm getting more and more busy with that organization. So I hope that I can make some opportunities to have some kind of, um, you know, hopefully back in person again. You know, it's not like I'm going to be able to do it in an annual meeting, but maybe at the climate committee. But I think that the trend that we might be paying attention to as a way to capture people's attention is that there's more and more talk as we talk about switching from carbon-based energy, there's more and more talk about building nuclear reactors. And people may have um, kind of native worry about that. And um, of course, the reactors are much smaller than they used to be. And I think that there are probably more reactors, you know, generating electricity than we know. But that might be a nice educational topic that might get people in. And then, you know, you might be able to talk about Hanford as part of that. Tom, Cecilia. Um. Well, we've, uh, I sat in on a couple of the uh, getting to know you meet and greets with new members um, uh, and sort of try to figure out how the HAB works. Um, and that was really nice to, to meet some folks coming onto the board and, you know, try to ease, ease them in a little bit uh, instead of, you know, uh, just jumping into the ice bath uh, tomorrow. Um, we also have, uh, the Oregon Hanford cleanup board meeting coming up in January. Um, we were we were shooting for Hood River, um, but it looks like you know with uh, travel and and Omicron, we're probably doing another one last virtual one. Um, but so that's uh, that's going to be uh, coming up pretty soon here, and I'm going to be giving a talk on the geology of Hanford, and it's going to be fun. Interesting. Yes, I had a great experience. I, it, uh, over Thanksgiving, I spent with my daughter in Atlanta, and we went to an After Seven concert. And, uh, you know, that's what I'm digging on you. You're digging on me. You know, it was great, you know. And so, well, you know, the people next, next to me asked me, well, where are you from? So I got a chance to tell them, and I got a tell them, chance to tell them a little bit about the history about Hanford and what it was all about. And uh, it was very interesting. Great, 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 uh, great time. Great visit with my my daughter and a good opportunity to talk a little bit about where I'm from and the legacy and history of Hanford. Thank you.
Anybody else? Uh, either experiences you've had or if you have some events coming up that you want to promote yeah. here. Um, Jeff, I can't raise my hand. Can I see you? Go ahead. Yeah. OK. Um, uh, I mentioned that we had a what was actually quite a fun tabling event at a concert at the Tacoma Dome at the guest of James Taylor and Jackson Brown um, and reached quite a good number of people, uh, you know, talking, we made a big display. We had citizen guides um, on the five year plan and vision for Hanford and display boards. Um, but uh, one other activity that we um, engaged in um, was supervising um students giving Hanford lessons relating to groundwater and hand cleanup contamination um, and environmental justice, including tribal and um, other populations at greater risk along the river uh, in Pasco High School in Pasco and in Mattawa. And um, very, you know, great learning experience for us to see the differences in understanding and knowledge about the site um, and uh, real lack of thought about any job opportunities, for example, in Mattawa, five miles upstream, and um, Pasco, you know, Chihu you know, Chihuahua High School in Pasco. Um, uh, but it was also surprising that even in Pasco, uh, Liz's comment really struck a nerve. Um, there were many students who did not know a great deal about Hanford. Um, and then one of the other things that we saw is that um, it, because we have a strong emphasis in my program on um, environmental justice and confronting racism, um, very few students know much about how racism and institutionalized racism is reflected in the development of the Tri-Cities and Hanford. Um, very few people know that you know, black workers were not allowed to um, live in Kennewick and Richland um, and had to live on the other side of the railroad tracks while they were building Hanford and then subsequent to building Hanford, they continued. Um, so it's very interesting to have this um, uh, high school interaction, which we be continuing um, as a way of, um, you know, building in lessons that related to earth sciences and environmental science and groundwater. I know um, uh, for one of the high schools, uh, the agencies had a series of presentations as well. Um, so uh, really good opportunity, but lots to learn there. All right. Um, thank you, everyone, for sharing around here. I see Ryan also put in the chat that Ecology is hosting its next uh, Let's Talk About Hanford event on January 13th. Ryan, what's the focus of that going to be? Yeah, this topic, it's going to, we call it a year in review. It's going to kind of look at uh, four or five uh, topics of, of ecology's work at Hanford in the last year or so. Um, so I, I know off the top of my head, a couple of the topics are going to be, you know, PFP wrapping up, um, the construction certification with DFLOS starting up, uh, 
and the air ambient boundary that one's a little more than a year old but um, we still thought we'd share about that one so we're just gonna be sharing at some high level topics and then of course as, as always we'll have a live question and answer session with anybody that's got questions and that the questions could be about the topics we present on or really any of the questions that you that people have about ecology's work at hanford so that's going to be 5 30 p.m on january 13th um, i can put the blog uh link in the chat for for people that's got the url because um, it's going to be on both WebEx and on uh, uh, Facebook Live. And we're hoping Ecology finally approves Zoom, uh, but we're waiting for our license. So we're hoping that the next event after this, we'll be able to use Zoom instead of WebEx. Cool. Thank you. All right, we're on to the final topic of the day, committee business. Uh, we're Going to try to lock down a date for our next PIC meeting and at least get a start on some topics uh, so that the agencies have some time to help us uh, make those topics successful. So let's start out with finding a date if we can. Uh, is it fair to assume that committee week in February is the most likely? Committee week is the 7th through the 10th of February. It's the first full week. OK, so for those who are participating now, uh, if, you, if you have anything on your calendars that week that we ought to know about now, that would be nice. Uh, or if people have a, a strong preference, usually we get, is it wrap is Tuesdays and tank waste is Wednesdays. And so really we're talking about a Monday or a Thursday, most likely. Not hearing strong preference there yet, but uh, if someone chimes in. The sooner you let us know, the better. Once we actually start planning and talking to SMEs and stuff like that, last minute changes are are tricky and they also make members cranky. <laughs> yeah. How flexible is scheduling? Help me with your question, Liz. Are you talking days, hours, lead time? Just. Um... And I really do apologize for that, my multitasking. You may have just said this. Um, I know we're solidifying the calendar tomorrow and Thursday. Um, this meeting, obviously, we're like, is pick committee week or the day before the board? Um, is it better for us to just decide that? Or are we just assuming that we're never before the board meeting? Or I, I know there's there was flexibility here because the schedule's been so wonky, but um, if that's helpful for us. Anyway, that's my question. How flexible is it for us to move it? <laughs> because I know that was a huge headache um, to get that all sorted out. I have a logistical opinion about the back end, but that's not actually a flexibility answer. Gary, you're the, you've got the flexibility answer. I have the bias about the back end. Yeah, committee week is far preferable, you know, because of the logistics that, that goes into it. Uh, so if we can if we can go with either February 7th or the 10th, uh, that's the first preference. The 10th has a, uh, a stakeholder call on. Uh, that Carrie usually runs, so I don't know if that has a impact on SME availability. Yeah, I'm not tracking that one, so that's news to me, Tom. Thank you. Shall we? Yeah, pencil in Monday the 7th of February. That gives us uh, almost two months. OK, uh, let's talk about some topics. Uh, 
we've got our standard stuff, which uh, committee elections uh, tend to happen in the February timeframe. So that's something where notice to all of you out there, if anyone is interested in being chair or vice chair of the pick, uh, please do throw your hat in the ring. It's it's better when we all take our turns as leaders. Uh, anything else on lists here? Let me pull up. We'd had a running list of potential November topics. Let me see if I can. And we've talked today about environmental justice and fleshing out that IM team. Uh, if there's anybody else who'd like to help us design the next conversation, uh, that would be helpful. And maybe we can have something to bring to February or something to specifically request for February. Um, if EPA, Roberto has any updates from the meetings that he has that we want to have some conversation based on that. Uh, or if we as an IM group or as a board or as, excuse me, as a committee want to talk about something specific to to move that conversation forward and keep us making progress. I think that some sort of placeholder there could be good. OK, no Emmy from EPA from 11 noon. OK. Yeah, I uh, stand so it's up. We'll go ahead. Oh, yeah, I was going to make a quick announcement because I wasn't sure uh, where to uh, say it. Yeah, for the seventh EPA uh, won't be available from 11 a.m. till noon. And for the 10th um, also won't be available from well, basically the same time uh, because I will probably be be in on that call for Hanford stakeholder engagement call. I've got Liz and Ryan in queue and Dan. Liz? Um, I was thinking of topics. Um, it seems like it might be helpful to, I don't know where we're going to, I don't know if it's possible to get that quarterly update that we talked about, but I would love to look at that. That's kind of like the quarter in review. Like, and maybe it's just re reinventing the calendar update. Um, that's the last three months and the upcoming three months. Um, I know there's going to be the FFRDC supplemental low activity waste. They're going to have their report coming out through the NAS, like a public meeting in April, I think, or around then. So it's not, it's just looking ahead, like what's going to be coming out that might need some public involvement. That really wouldn't be DOE doing it, but there would be Hanford advisory board interest in it. I don't know where we're at with some of the, the TBI weir comment period is going to be over by then. Um, yeah. So there's yeah. some maybe, um, things in review on that um, and sounds like maybe there's maybe there'll be more inf information on the five-year TPA review um, that Roberto shared that we could maybe dive into more and have the time to prepare for that to find out what is that what kind of public involvement um, what could public involvement look like on that is there an opportunity to bring that principles and parameters kind of round up the central plateau end states conversation um, into some meeting design. And I know I missed that conversation this afternoon. I apologize for that. Um, but it seems like there might be room for an issue manager team to have, I don't know, to help frame something like that in January for February topic around the agency's request for some more concrete ideas on the end states that kind of weaves together the TPA five year review and um, the principles and parameters, but that's a lot, sorry. Ryan and then Dan and then Steve. Okay, 
Yeah, I was going to share that for the environmental justice kind of topics. Uh, as you guys know, I know back at one of the PIC meetings earlier this year, Ginger and I kind of presented on a little bit of environmental justice and the HEAL Act from Ecology. Um, if you guys pick a specific um, environmental justice topic early enough, we might be able to have uh, Millie Piazza on. Um, that might give her enough notice so that we can reserve a spot on her calendar to come talk to, to the PIC. So just just an idea to throw out there. If we have enough notice, we can possibly get Millie on, and she's fantastic. Thanks. Sounds like we need to have a EJ IM team discussion probably in early January. So let the holidays happen, but then figure out where we're going. And Jerry, I did see what you put in the chat, so we'll. So on that I am team right now, I've got Liz, Jeff, Dan Solitz, and Emmett. Of course, Emmett. Emmett. Did I miss anybody? Did I miss anybody? You can put me in, Ruth. That was my hand coming up, Steve. Anderson. Oh, Steve. Okay. Steve. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you all for jumping in. Dan Solitz, you had your hand up. I can't say oh, that. I put my hand down. I was volunteering for the IM team for environmental justice. All right. And Steve, you had your hand up as well. Yeah, kind of along the same lines. I, yeah, I thought the environmental justice issue or, uh, or the TPA thing would be worthy of conversation. So I, I'm in the IM. Okay. okay. If we could blend the TPA five year review public process into the TPA public calendar quarterly review topic and just make sure that we dedicate enough time for that. That seems kind of like the formal official public comment processes topic. And they seem related. We also talked about a uh, comment response document and going through or at least understanding what comment responses had been submitted in the last, let's say three to six months, you know, since this is our first go at it, and maybe have some links ahead of time or an ability to, to look at one or two of them just to get some general impressions and feedback if the pick has any on you know, comment responses, since I don't think that's something we've looked at in the time that I've been around. There was also talk uh, from Dan Solitz about the DOE at the headquarters level consent based citing process. Um, and this, I guess, would be an ask for Gary to just float a balloon up and see if there is anybody at headquarters who sees value and interest in talking to the board about those efforts and how they're being designed and what the goals are and whether and how. Hanford or the state of Washington might interact with that. Um, that's something that we could talk about. And Tom is pointing out that that's specific to spent fuel, uh, not defense high level waste. I think that some of the concepts might apply, but it's fair point. Does anybody else have any uh, specific topic thoughts for February to help agencies prepare? I've got this list that we put together on one of our planning calls. Um, we talked about things like the new member orientation and welcome, which is going to be happening this afternoon. Um, we also talked about new member recruitment and outreach related to the upcoming packets, which are due, I think, in February. We might miss the bus on that one if you know, it might be a little bit too close to time. Um, but talking about how the agencies try to engage and recruit membership. Um, making Hanford fun topic, Liz puts in the chat. 
are there any one on ones that might be beneficial to the new members that we could use? That's a good question. Uh, maybe can we add that? I know that we're having a thing just this afternoon, but if people want to put in a request, new members of uh, just brainstorming what you want to hear a one on one on that this afternoon seems like a prime opportunity to gather that feedback. You know, we're actually starting to design our March board meeting, which is pretty much going to be Hanford 101 almost the entire time. So it's going to be a great training opportunity. We were going to try to get some of that in uh, in the December meeting, but because we had so much leftover business, we had to bump that out to March. So uh, still designing that and uh, but but I'll be happy to take some feedback on and requests on that. Andrew? This just popped into my head. We have, maybe I can find it. We used to have a Hanford trivia like Jeopardy game. Um, we probably can't use the Jeopardy format because of copyright infringements, um, but we could probably reformat that and post that somewhere and share it with the new members. And, you know, DOE does have a lot of good videos, plus the our let's talk about things. We could give that give the new membership kind of a crib sheet of <clears throat> um, good places to just learn some basics if they aren't if they aren't familiar with them. Um, and you know, or like the Columbia Riverkeeper had a really good video a couple years ago and and sharing links to to the nonprofit groups as well as the agencies so people can get the different tone and perspective um, seems like it would be a, a good easy way to do it whether they choose to go watch them or not is up to them but if we make it easy and they don't just because if they search google of course they'll just get everything in the universe and won't know where to start So when you guys do the Hanford 101 in, in March, are you going to talk about the end state of Hanford? <laughs> Seems like a pretty important 101 topic. Where are we going? Emmett, where are we going? Emmett, Emmett. what you got? You're on mute. Let's get you off of mute so we can we can hear you. I'm sorry. You know, the WTP uh, uh, video, the one where they actually uh, can go to the different uh, components. Have you seen that one? The one that done by, uh, it was done by Vivid. Have you seen that one? That is, that is a really good one to show. I'll see if I can, I'll dig it out and send it. Who should I send it to? To you, Ruth, or to to Jeff, or who? Why don't you send it to both Jeff and me, and we'll okay. we'll figure it out. Okay, we'll do. Okay. Uh, so we'll have, I think, potentially in a next phase of environmental justice topic, um, we'll have maybe a an expanded TPA public involvement type discussion that includes the five year review and um, comment responses and that kind of thing. Uh, maybe the looking back at the September meeting, we talked about the GAO report and accessibility of technical information and all that kind of stuff. Haven't made any progress on that, I have to admit, but maybe by February there will be something to report. Um, we've got voting, got open forum, uh, just float the balloon about consent based siting, uh, fun at Hanford as a 
potential topic and how we I think there's something there. Any others? Especially if it's one where we want to, we want to give, give the agencies notice, and see if they can develop some can develop material. material. I was just thinking, um, Jeff, this is Steve Anderson again. Um, maybe just in helping define and think about what it will be like to come back together and how that might work um, would be really good from an, a new members as well as an existing members perspective. Um, cause that's going to be, it's going to be a bit of a hurdle. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think, uh, I think we started that conversation today and we opened up some of the questions and considerations, but we're checking on that regularly. It's probably a good idea. Yeah. All right. Are there any other items for the good of the order? I just put two things in the chat. Um, I don't know if we need it just for consideration, maybe a poll that we could help put together so it wouldn't be on Ruth's plate or there's like a clear, what questions would we want to know from board members to design um, an in-person setup and like, I don't know when we'd want that going out, but like how soon would you be willing to, to get together? What what would make you feel safe or well, you know, those kinds of things so that we have it ready to go when it looks like it's actually something that is possible. Um, and then I just don't know for agency info, if there's anything you're gonna know about the five-year TPA review or if that needs to be flagged for another committee, it's kind of like a, Committee of the whole topic, though. So, um, or like all committees are going to be interested in it. So maybe pick is a good place to hold that, or just have a placeholder, because um, it seems like there's that's still an evolving topic too. Just if there's, I don't know if we can get more data than we had today, but that would be great if they if it's possible. Thanks. Um, so. Question from Tom Cecilia. Uh, Gary, do you know, does the EMSSAB have any vaccine mandates for meetings? Or is it location by location? Good question. I, I think it is probably uh, location by location, but I will have to dig into that. I, I think it uh, may depend. Uh, and, and I'm not even going to go down that rabbit trail because I don't know what I'm talking about, but I will ask the question. Yeah, because the mandates for employees and contractors and I mean. Yeah, it's complicated, I think. All right. Well, with that, thank you everyone again for giving your day, um, helping us have these conversations. <sighs> There's more to come. Um, new members especially, but even the returners, uh, we've got the new member orientation starting at 4.30. Right, uh, and actually we are calling it member orientation because we didn't mm -hmm. want to just be for new members. Okay, a good reminder for us all. Which is why everybody got member notebooks. Hint, hint. Thank you. All right. Thanks to Josh and Olivia. I I don't think I had a whole lot to do with it. It was it was staff. Here we go. Marathon week. Uh, so again, thanks everyone. Uh, enjoy a little break and. Uh, Tomorrow is the big show. See you there. All right. If you didn't get enough of us today, we'll see you. Today. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Take care. Everybody. Thanks, Jeff. Take care, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank